Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for taking part in this webinar on the subject of the quality of air here in Sofia, in Bulgaria. I'm Jérôme Boutin. I'm the director of CityPaz Association. I will uh, introduce you to our organization later. I will be your moderator. I will speak in French and I will stay with you throughout this webinar. Before kicking off, some technical aspects. Three aspects. First, please keep your micros and cameras switched off until the end of the webinar. Only the cameras of the speakers may uh, stay switched on. Second aspect, this webinar will be interpreted in three languages, Bulgarian, French and English. In order to listen to the interpretation, please click on the globe icon below in the Zoom bar. Third aspect, you can ask questions at any time through the Zoom chat. So you need to look at the Zoom band down, uh, down below in order to hear. We would like to ask you to ask your questions in English via the chat. There will be no questions uh, submitted orally. If you have questions uh, regarding to a certain participant, please turn on your camera and, and we will be able to interpret your question. We will start with some introductory speeches. And for me, it is a pleasure It is a pleasure to introduce Mr. Borislav Sandov. Thank you. Your Excellency, dear participants in today's webinar dedicated to air quality. At the beginning, let me express my gratitude to the Embassy of France in Bulgaria and in particular you, Madam Ambassador, for the initiative, commitment and organization of today's event. The topic of improving the air quality is among my main priorities, which I announced when I took office. Air pollution is an extremely serious, not only environmental, but also social threat, posing many challenges in terms of management and mitigation of the impact of harmful pollutants. The time has definitely come to recognize uh, the available approaches to solving the problem, to move from visions and ambitious to real action and concrete results. The effective action to reduce the impact of air pollution require profound changes, both in the policies and in the way of life and thinking of each of us. Concern about human health and well-being is a powerful driver of the environmental policy and the need for more systematic and integrated approaches to addressing the challenges is definitely recognized by us and by the society in general. We all know that the main problem in Bulgaria is the excessive pollutant, uh, pollution with particular matter, uh, particulate uh, matter uh, caused mainly by sectors such as domestic heating and transport. As a result of the action taken in recent years, a stable trend is observed towards improving air quality and achieving the legal standards of the, uh, for, the particulate, uh, for the particulate matter content. However, it should be clearly emphasized that the necessary and desired results have not been achieved yet. There is why, as soon as I took office, I announced the allocation of significant uh, financial resources, through which the plans and measures to improve air quality should not remain only on paper. 750 million lever are provided for the improvement of air quality during the next programming period, 2021-2027, uh, under the environmental program. Environment program. 
Moreover, for the first time, the government will also provide national funds in the amount of uh, around 47 million level under a new mechanism of which, on which we are working hard and which we will start soon. We envisage uh, 30 to 47 million uh, level, it depends on the, uh, because of the, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, there will be probably some limitations, but still between 30 and 47 million level will be allocated uh, from national funding to this. Uh, <clears throat> You will be told more about this matter by the representative of the Ministry of Environment and Water a little bit later in the, in the third panel. Last but not least, we are also working with the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy to end the energy benefits in the form of coal and wood, especially coal, mainly taking into account that the excess of the uh, PM standards, the particulate matters, uh, matter standards, is mainly due to the domestic heating and the transport. Here I make uh, the explicit clarification to that, uh, so that there is no speculations. That is no, that is, it is not a case of uh, stopping the social benefits, but instead stopping just uh, replacing the coal uh, and food, but especially coal. As, uh, as a social uh, support for the, uh, for the households. I will stop here, and in conclusion, I will note that the guarantee for achieving success, which will be left by every Bulgarian citizen, which will be paired, not left, will be paired by every Bulgarian citizen, uh, is how all of us, politicians, experts, representatives of the civil society, the science, and the business will be able to work together in search of effective and result-oriented solutions. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Monsieur Sandov, pour cette introduction très claire et très concise. Uh, je, maintenant, j'ai l'honneur. Monsieur... Uh, thank you very much. I will now uh, give the floor for a video message. by the European Commissioner for Environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to address you at the start of this webinar on air quality issues in Bulgaria. My thanks to the French Embassy and its partners for organizing this event. This web webinar is very timely because this is a very exciting moment for EU air policy. Last year we spelled out our ambition very clearly in the Zero Pollution Action Plan. By 2050 we want to reduce air, water and soil pollution to levels no longer harmful to nature and health. Turning that vision into reality doesn't mean waiting for 2050, it means stepping up action today. That's the commitment we made in the European Green Deal and that's why we are working on several legislative proposals that will take us closer to these clean air goals. This year we will revise the EU air quality standards, aligning them more closely with scientific recommendations. We will also strengthen the legislative framework for sources of air pollution, revisiting the Industrial Emissions Directive and the Euro 7 emission standards for vehicles. And under the French Presidency, the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament will continue their deliberations on the new proposal for CO2 standards for cars and the energy efficiency of buildings. All these files are good for the climate and they also mean cleaner air. Lastly, 2022 will be an important year in assessing compliance with other uh, pillar of EU clean air legislation the Directive on National Emission Reduction Commitments, which covers five further air pollutants, while we continue, of course, to implement all other aspects of this directive. Looking at the picture across Europe today, we see many member states struggling to meet their clean air obligations. Bulgaria is one example. The levels of particulate matter are especially concerning, and this has been the case in ambient air for a number of years. The fact that it is a long-standing problem doesn't make it acceptable. The costs of this pollution are tremendous for human health, the environment and the economy. Not all measures are easy to apply, but the price of failing to act is extremely high. Here, pollution needs to be tackled at source. There are tools 
and opportunities that should be seized immediately. EU funding, including the recovery and resilience facility of next generation EU, suffers large opportunities for economic recovery with cleaner air, leaving no one behind. And the EU Life Programme can also be used to boost implementation efforts on the ground. It's there to help replace old boilers, improve energy efficiency in buildings, improve the uptake of non-combustible renewable energy and improve sustainable transport. The live clean air integrated project is a good example of what can be done. Addressing the clean air challenge means working together across all levels and in all sectors. It means engaging with citizens and their health and quality of life will benefit most from action to clean the air. If you want effective policies, you need citizen engagement. So I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate ERBG.info for the great work they do in coordinating citizen scientists. These volunteers install their own air quality sensors and feed their data to an open source platform, showing once again that information is power and that citizens are the force for change. In fact, looking at today's agenda, it's wonderful to see so many different actors taking part. Public authorities, financial institutions, businesses and the civil sector. This is exactly the engagement we need to tackle the clean air challenge. Thank you for your presence and I wish you a fruitful event. Cite un certain nombre de possibilités de financement européen, mais ceci est le sujet du deuxième panel. Nous aurons l'occasion d'approfondir ce sujet capital, évidemment, des moyens mis à disposition pour réaliser la transition, notamment en Bulgarie. Exercise is the measures for uh, financing all measures. This is extremely important for the transition in Bulgaria. Now I have the pleasure of giving the floor to Her Excellency, the French Ambassador to Bulgaria, Ms. Florence Robin. Ms. Florence Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister in charge of environment, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Sandov and all the uh, experts working in the area of uh, environment. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to uh, take part in this seminar that is uh, conducted um, by the European Commission and the European Union under the presidency of the, uh, of the French presidency. Uh, we know that air quality is a measurable symptom of our economic and social status at the crossroads of our way of movement, heating, manufacturing, and our health. Ms., um, Mr. Minister, you said that uh, the air pollution on our health is now a recognized fact. The World Health Organization has estimated the number of premature deaths caused each year by the air pollution at 7 million. It has been scientifically established that air pollution plays a key and a clearly aggravating role in the incidence of deaths linked to COVID-19. So uh, like other European countries, France also needs to improve its air quality. Uh, the official assessment conducted in France in 2020 confirms that the air quality has generally improved between 2000 and, tw and 2020. Mortality has decreased significantly. To achieve these initial results, France has implemented a number of measures, including low emission mobility zones, that allow local authorities to limit the movement of the most polluting vehicles uh, on their territories. I will start by citing the French experience that air quality can only be improved by means of an integrated approach. To reduce pollution, it is indeed necessary to take actions at the main sources of pollutant by designing an overall strategy, integrating the main sources and factors of pollution. For example, uh, during the uh, energy renovation or sanitation of buildings that have been supported, which was also pointed out by the commissioner, uh, which is part of the recovery and resilience plans, uh, we have the opportunity to connect directly the, these buildings with renewable energy sources. And I sincerely believe 
in this connection, in this uh, relation, this was also pointed out by the Ministry of Finance in Bulgaria, that geothermal energy has a great potential in Bulgaria. The same integrated logic and approach applies to traffic whether it is a clean uh, mobility, carpooling or uh, cycling or, or sustainable infrastructure with the development of charging stations for like electric vehicles. We have designed this webinar as a platform for exchange and dialogue, bringing together financial institutions, experts, municipalities and experts. There will be a few videos shown today that will show you the solution at work that will show software modeling the dispersion of pollutants in the air, air pollution control, equipment at industrial sites and the sanitation of air in buildings. The French presidency of the Council of the European Union is an ideal moment for making a mutual evaluation between our countries and for sharing good practices. In this context, the uh, embassy is organizing two events on air quality. This webinar is the first part, which will provide the technical aspects and useful information for the face-to-face -face conference, which is the second event that will be organized by the French Institute on the 7th of April. And the topic will be how cities can deal with, uh, with air pollution. I would like to thank all the speakers for their participation and for sharing their experiences. The fight against air pollution is everybody's business, member states, European institutions, municipalities, academic institutions, businesses, etc. I would also like to salute Veolia for kindly supporting the organization of this webinar. And finally, I would like to thank Mr. Boutang, director of CITIPA, and thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to your um, interventions. Thank you so much, Madam Ambassador. I can say that uh, what you presented is a wide range of So, I, I would like to, this problem needs to be resolved. You also mentioned about the clean air. I will mention about what you mentioned about so we're talking about integration we talk about environmental pollution and climate changes all these measures are related with depollution of the air and this will allow us to reduce the emissions Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. We will now proceed. We will continue with the first panel. There will be, I will tell you how we will proceed. You mentioned, Madam Ambassador, that our, that this will be a, a panel, this will be a dialogue. Everybody will be able to uh, everybody will have the chance to speak. Each panel will take about 25 minutes. We will have we will have uh, four uh, participants, four guest speakers. After that, we will proceed with the second panel, and we will uh, talk about the financing of European and financial uh, institutions and how that is dealt. And the third panel will uh, emphasize the various strategies for dealing with uh, the pol polluted air, as well as the solutions that allow us uh, to tackle this issue. We will have guests and consultants. How can we proceed? How are we going to proceed? We will first start with the first panel. There will be questions and answers at the end. 
Some will, some will leave sooner. Some of the speakers need to leave. So we will have question and answers after the first period. And we will do the same with uh, uh, the session two for those speakers that need to leave sooner. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will have a question and answer session. Now, it is my pleasure to give the floor to a, uh, an expert from the uh, ge Director General um, for Environment, the European Commission. And thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, maybe just two uh, quick technical points. Oh, I see that uh, the PowerPoint is there, so I hope everyone can see it. So that's uh, already done, very good. Um, indeed, I will have to leave in a little bit more than 20 minutes. So I just want to say that in, uh, in the sense that I'm very happy to answer any questions there are before that. So depending on how timing goes, uh, don't hesitate to let me know uh, when you would like uh, to address, if or when you would like to address any questions um, that I, of course, would be happy to answer before I leave. Um, yeah, so I will be looking at um, our air policy framework and uh, specifically at the changes that are uh, upcoming and that we are working on. Uh, so we can go to, to the next slide. Um, and here, um, this is uh, an overview of the air policy framework uh, that we have in place in the EU. So you see on top of the slide, uh, the ambient air quality directives. These are the directives that define the result that we would like to achieve um, in terms of the concentrations of pollutants in ambient air. So the level of air quality we want to achieve and the standards uh, that we have set for that. Now, on the bottom are two very important parts as well. One is the National Emission Reduction Commitments Directive. Um, now, what this defines are, um, or what this addresses, are national emission totals. So, per year, what is the total of uh, emissions per pollutant that is part of this directive um, that we permit, and how much should they be uh, reduced over time? The other part are uh, the source-specific emission standards. Um, and uh, Commissioner Sinkovicius already mentioned, for instance, the Industrial Emissions Directive um, and also the Euro standards um, that are both being uh, revised at the moment. Um, there are a number of others as well, for instance, uh, for eco-design eco for space heaters and boilers, um, for medium combustion plants, um, and also energy efficiency standards that have an important impact. So this is the overall framework that we have in place. And I will concentrate now very much on the one that is on top here, the um, ambient air quality directive, simply because of the changes that are um, upcoming on this. So with that, I would move to the next slide. And here you have the commitment uh, that the commission has made in the European uh, Green Deal on these directives and on air quality meaning that uh, we will draw on the lessons learned from the evaluation of the current air quality legislation, um, propose to strengthen provisions on monitoring, modeling, um, and on air quality plans, um, but also notably um, that the Commission will propose to revise air quality standards to align them more closely with recommendations of the World Health Organization. <coughs> and for that, also to keep in mind, that the WHO, the World Health Organization, has revised their recommendations in September of last year. So this is a new set of recommendations that we are looking at since September last year. Next slide, please. Yeah, what will these uh, revisions change? And then we can already go to the next slide. Um, basically, what we will be looking at are um, five uh, shortcomings, um, and uh, I will only look at those five and not at, at the complete set of things on this slide, but they will be shared with you, I'm sure, after the meeting. Um, and these five shortcomings have been identified in the evaluation of the uh, directives. And one very important one um, is about health outcomes. So the current standards, as we have them, are not fully aligned with scientific advice. Um, they are not as strict. 
Um, and that is, of course, an issue with ter um, in terms of health and the outcomes um, of uh, the air quality as we have it. Then we have enforcement shortcomings uh, where we see that exceedances of our standards are not always addressed sufficiently or on time. We also uh, have some governance shortcomings in that air quality plans do not always address all sources effectively. And then we also see some shortcomings um, in terms of the assessment of air quality, the monitoring, <coughs> where maybe some flexibilities, um, maybe a problem for comparing data, and some information shortcomings um, that we will also be looking at. Next slide, please. So based on um, these shortcomings, what will we be looking at? So revising the ambient air quality directives, um, based on the current as we have them. One thing, I already said it, we will look at a closer alignment of the air quality standards with scientific knowledge, and that includes notably the latest recommendations of the WHO of September of last year. The second one <coughs> is improving the legislative framework on air quality, and that includes that we will be taking a close look at penalties and public information as well in particular. And the third area um, is, as was already said in the Green Deal, that we will strengthen um, the way we monitor air quality, how we make best use of modeling, and how uh, we can improve the provisions that are there on air quality plans so that they are effective and uh, achieve their goals. Now, these things will be looked at to then further develop them into more de detailed policy options and scenarios for each area. And then we will be looking at different levels of ambitions uh, for each policy option or scenario. Next slide, please. Yeah, how do we assess uh, these policy options? Um, and that is actually on the next slide, um, which will look a bit colorful. So we can go to the next one. So here we have these three policy areas that I just talked about on the standards, legislative framework, and um, monitoring, modeling, and plans. And basically, um, I mean, this is trying to simplify it um, a little bit, um, but basically we will look at different uh, ambition levels that are here um, symbolized with uh, the colors that you have. We'll always look at a baseline. So basically, what would it mean in the future if um, we to make any change to uh, what is in place? And then a low ambition, a mid ambition, and a high ambition uh, scenario. And just to give you um, an idea what that could mean, for instance, when it comes to uh, the standards, um, when we look at um, fine particulate matter, um, the high ambition scenario would be one where it would go exactly to the level of um, the uh, WHO recommendations that they recommend, which is five micrograms per cubic meter in ambient air. And then we would uh, go to mid and low ambition going a bit down, looking at interim targets that uh, the WHO um, has defined. And we would also be looking for these at different timeframes. So at 2030 and at 2050, because that of course changes um, the level of ambition one has as well, how fast we would um, need to get uh, to that level. Um, that is very short and simplified. Much more information is available on our, our websites um, and uh, very publicly available, um, a much longer version of this presentation as well. Uh, so happy to share some links there if you want to dig a little bit more into the information. But for now, since I know time is running and we have more interesting speakers coming up. Um, which is perfect. Thank you very much, because I'm going to the last slide. Um, which is just to give you um, a little bit of an overview of the timeline that we're looking at. We are um, in the phase where we are conducting an impact assessment right now on the aspects that I've just outlined. Um, and uh, we will be looking in the second half um, of the year at adopting a legislative proposal. And then, of course, this will go to the co-legislators, to, uh, to the Council of the European Union with the member states, and to the European Parliament to be negotiated next year. Um, yeah, and I will leave it at that. And of course, if there are any questions, then very happy to answer those.
Alors, je, je regarde s'il y a des questions dans le, dans le chat. Pour l'instant, non. Moi, j'en ai une pour M. Klinkenberg. Um, Est-ce que… So, I don't see questions in the chat. So, my question is, can Bulgaria receive and take advantage? Is it possible to use some grace period before imposing these regulations of transition and all the measures that will be and all the measures that will be taken? Is it possible to extend this grace period? Is it possible? Is it possible for the European Union to do, for each to make it possible that each member state comply with this? which um, of course comprise um, economic factors, uh, social factors, um, energy factors, etc. That being said, of course, all European citizens um, have the same right to good health and to, to breathe in clean air. Um, so what we are looking at uh, with the current legislation is air quality standards that apply um, throughout. That being said, of course, another part that one should not forget is in terms of achieving those standards, um, there is a lot of funding available, and you mentioned it in the beginning, uh, rightly so. And in certain cases, when it comes to structural funds, uh, for instance, a lot more is available for different parts of Europe than uh, for others. Um, so that is something that we have very much in mind and that we will continue to have in mind, that we, of course, want to support uh, implementation of the legislation and getting to the standards um, with funding and with other types of uh, implementation, implementation uh, support so that everyone can get there. Je vous remercie. Euh, donc, j'ai une question ici. Euh, quels sont euh, les résultats? Thank you very much. I have a question. You can see the question. What are the main outcomes from the public consultation on AAQD that ended in December 2021? Which is AAQD? What are the main results out of this public consultation? By the way, it's someone in the know here, I think, uh, because AAQD means ambient air quality directives. So that's the legislation we're talking about. Um, uh, so we had lots of responses on it. Um, it's probably best if you're interested in the detailed uh, results to go on to um, our, on the Have Your Say page that we have on the, on the portal. Um, because there you will have uh, a summary report. So I can, um, uh, right after this, put it in, into the chat the link. And there you have um, a synopsis report, and there is detailed information on the different uh, responses. That's probably the most efficient. Je vous remercie. Uh, donc, Monsieur Klinkenberg, je ne vois pas d'autres questions dans le chat pour l'instant. Thank you very much to Mr. Klinkenberg. I don't see any other questions. Please stay until the end of panel number one. So probably there will be some questions from the audience. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to the representative from the World Bank Miss Eolina Milova, and she will speak. She will speak about her PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss uh, Mr. Butan. And uh, let me first apologize to my Bulgarian-speaking colleagues that I'll deliver this presentation in English. But I guess that will be most convenient for all participants uh, to follow the slides. Uh, so, uh, dear Mrs. Uh, Ambassador, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, dear colleagues, let me first of all congratulate and thank the French Embassy for the initiative and for the excellent organization of this webinar, which I believe is a very useful contribution to moving forward the important agenda of air quality improvement in Bulgaria, as this is becoming an urgent topic, not only in the light of the EU infringement procedure related to air pollution, but also due to the increasing public health concerns that need to be addressed. 
Uh, can you move the presentation, please? And on to the next slide, please. So uh, I would like to kick this off uh, with a very quick retrospective slide on the past World Bank support to the air quality agenda in Bulgaria that started back in 2016 with the government decision to provide a policy response to the growing concern of air pollution in the Bulgarian largest cities. And over a nearly four year period, the bank implemented in partnership with the Ministry of uh, Environment, a comprehensive policy support and capacity building program on improving air quality management in the country addressed not only at national policy level, but also provided some practical tools to support the local level capacity. At national level, the World Bank Advisory Project contributed to development of national air quality analytical and policy framework for reducing emissions of air pollutants and their associated health impacts. But the main output of this program was the delivery of uh, um, proposals for two national programs, National Air Quality Improvement Program in line with the EU CAFE Directive and the National Air Pollution Control Program in line with the revised uh, emission ceiling directive. Uh, the project went a step further, analyzing the reasons for systemic non-compliance at local level and produced implementation support tools and guidance documents for the municipalities to improve their capacity and understanding of the implementation strategies needed at local level. Next one, please. So this slide presents the 28 agglomerations that are subject to the infringement procedure currently uh, in ECJ. And although some progress has been achieved, uh, as also um, the Mr. Minister uh, pointed out, uh, with mean annual exceedances in most of the uh, cities already complying with the standards, some municipalities in Bulgaria still remain non-compliant with the EU CAFE directive in uh, terms of daily exceedances, mostly in winter. Next one. So as evident from this slide, the major source of primary PM10 uh, emissions or particular matter emissions and the main cause for limit value exceedances in Bulgaria is burning solid fuels for household heating. And as you can see from the graph on the right hand side, the exceedances remain mainly in winter and sin since the demand for household heating in the winter is significant in Bulgaria. And in small urban municipalities and in rural areas, this is met largely by burning solid fuels. Next one, please. The use of unseasoned firewood and poor quality indigenous coal burnt in old traditional stoves, some of which you can see on the slide, is the main cause of poor air quality in the winter. World Bank analysis performed during this um, uh, advisory program show that uh, above 400,000 households in these 28 non-compliant municipalities burn firewood and coal in thermally inefficient solid fuel um, uh, appliances. And this accounts for at least 85% of estimated local uh, PM emissions. This figure may be updated based on the census from uh, 2021, but it overall demonstrates that reaching compliance with the air quality standards relies heavily on replacing old inefficient household heating appliances burning solid fuels, and in particular in municipalities with exceedances. To achieve this effectively, there is need to identify the sources of emissions in these municipalities, meaning the households that burn them in inefficient polluting appliances. At the same time, the replacement programs uh, with cleaner fuels or technologies need to take account of the local context of each municipality. Um, next one, please. So very briefly, just reminding uh, the scope of measures uh, foreseen in the National Air Quality Improvement Program, which uh, we also suggested as a result of this analysis. These are measures introducing cleaner technology, measures supporting cleaner fuels. And here, just one caveat, perhaps also to note, um, uh, which is rather an update uh, to the program, is that uh, in the context of the EU Green Deal uh, and the commitment to decarbonization, some of the measures suggested uh, in this program, particularly as regards uh, standards for coal uh, or gas may no longer receive EU funding support. So also the scope of measures may need revisiting in the light of the new decarbonization commitments. And also targeted legal instruments is the uh, third uh, important area that I'm going to uh, mention a little bit further in the presentation. Uh, next one, please. So we do consider establishing low emission zones for household heating as a key regulatory measure to enable municipalities to mandate a phasing out of polluting appliances. And in order to delineate such low emission zones, the municipality needs to do a mapping of existing emissions from households drawing it on its local emissions inventories. 
And uh, just uh, a picture here on this slide uh, on something that we did uh, under the Air Quality Advisory and Capacity Building Program. We supported the municipalities by developing templates and methodologies for mapping of household emissions. This could be used in outlining uh, of the scopes of the low emission zones, but also for planning of an investment program under the operational program or environment or other funding source to effectively uh, direct resources to the pollution hotspots. Can we move to the next one? So just to have the few, a full picture, let me also very briefly present the contribution of the transport sector to the PM10 emissions, although this is not significant contributor in all cities. Uh, but still, um, it may have a relatively large share in, in, in the uh, bigger ones. So all diesel engine vehicles, but not only, uh, also the suboptimal vehicle maintenance and performance are the main contributors to road transport emissions in Bulgaria. Not only almost 70% of the passenger vehicle fleet is over 15 uh, years old, but also in Bulgaria, removal of catalytic converters and diesel particular filters from even new uh, Euro 5.6 models, uh, either for financial reasons or to increase vehicles power is widespread. And this practice actually increases emissions of even new vehicles significantly. Hence, uh, measures to address these um, emissions need to be taken um, uh, in addition to the measures to invest to cleaner vehicles. Uh, next one. So um, very also quickly, I uh, um, want to mention that in addition to stricter control in the registration of vehicles, um, attention needs to be paid to improved periodic technical inspections to ensure that vehicles operate under their production specifications, but also improve control of vehicles on the road to ensure that they are operating according to their production standards in real driving environment. As regards low emission zones for transport, these uh, could be considered, but only in larger municipalities where the impact of transport on PM10 emissions is significant. Next one, please. So uh, this is, uh, well, the policy framework that I just presented and uh, also uh, confirmed by the National Air Quality Improvement Program still needs- Madame Milova, il vous reste une minute. Merci still needs effective implementation response, which relies on creating the necessary enabling environment. Such enabling environment in our view is built on three pillars, which we described in a report developed in 2020, looking ahead in the National uh, Air Quality Improvement program, program implementation. So the first pillar is the regulatory pillar, and it is related to strengthening the national and local level legislation that allows the municipalities to establish low emission zones for residential heating. And uh, as we know that some action has been taken on, on the national level uh, on the Clean Air Act, the municipalities with PM exceedances still need to act on issuing local regulations, establishing such low emission zones on the territory of the hotspots identified on the basis of their local air quality problems, but also applying the methodology described above. The second pillar of the enabling environment is strengthening municipal capacity. Municipalities need sufficient capacity to prepare and implement effective stove replacement programs, but most, and especially the less populous ones, lack the human and financial resources to do so. So the weak capacity of many municipalities mean that many tasks uh, that are essential to planning and implementing such programs are unlikely to be performed effectively without external su support. So that's why we have suggested in our 2020 report to de dedicate a special support unit in an existing institution or organization that would play a substantial role in providing planning, technical communication support to these municipalities who need it in both uh, air quality project preparation, but also implementation, and to help them oversee the implementation of their local air quality programs. So the third pillar is the implementation funding. So OPE, Operation Program Environment, is foreseen as being the main national source of funding for implementing the program, uh, but as such, um, um, it, it would provide a large share of the necessary uh, funding to cover the funding gap. However, supplementary funding for um, stove replacement may be needed to fully implement measures in the um, outlined in the two, uh, programs um, related to air quality to close the financial gap and reach compliance with the best standards in the 28 municipalities. Next one, please. And just on the funding gap, uh, few Madame Milova, je vais vous demander de, de conclure. Je suis désolé. Quitte à ce que vous vous reveniez. Euh, à l'issue de, de questions sur certains points, mais, mais pour respecter le timing. Merci yes. si vous voulez bien conclure. Sure, this is my last slide, so just in time. Uh, so, um, as regards the funding gap, just just the last point, um, uh, just mentioning a figure 
that we um, came up with uh, in our analysis. Uh, I mean, about 200,000 uh, traditional solid fuel appliances may need replacement beyond the ones considered under the um, uh, environmental program. And if Bulgaria is uh, to uh, cover, to um, close the, um, this uh, financial gap and to reach its legally binding air quality targets, uh, this uh, residual financing sync gap is to be filled. So that's why the government institutions need to work in coordination to identify opportunities to scale up supplementary funding to replace all of the remaining uh, polluting stoves. And uh, also eligible alternatives need to be clarified in the context of the EU Green Deal uh, and uh, National Climate and Energy Plan. The beneficial role of uh, fiscal instruments uh, should be also um, uh, studied and encouraged. Uh, and just the last one, please, uh, the concluding slide. Um, let me uh, just mention uh, that um, international experience has shown that significant co-benefits can be achieved between air quality management and climate change mitigation. And in order such, for such co-benefits to be achieved, policy development measures on these two issues should be well coordinated. And the path to low carbon growth that Bulgaria will need to follow can contribute to cleaner air improvements in health. However, air quality measures implementation need targeted approach in line with the proposed pillars of the enabling environment for the program implementation. And of course, the World Bank is ready to uh, and willing to support this process. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Madame Bilova. Alors, j'étais indulgent sur le, sur le temps qui vous est consacré. D'une part, parce que c'était intéressant et parce que vous avez. Thank you, Ms. Milova. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. I know that the time is short and we need to proceed. I don't see any questions in the chat, so we will proceed. I believe that these issues or we should pay more focus and attention to domestic heating that use solid fuel uh, like wood. This makes me believe and ask the question whether there are programs conducted by the World Bank that uh, if you have any best practices or if uh, there's any experience as to how this is applied and how they do that, and uh, if there is anything that can be applied to Bulgaria. Yes, thanks very much for this question, Mr. Bhutan. Uh, yes, indeed, um, the bank, uh, the World Bank has been implementing uh, air quality programs uh, across Europe. Uh, not only in European countries, but most recently also preparing a series of intervention in the Western Balkans. So we do uh, have moved um, uh, forward, uh, um, I mean, in advance of the policy advice uh, provided here in Bulgaria and actually have used a lot of the um, knowledge that we have accumulated in uh, Bulgaria to apply, uh, particularly in the Western Balkan countries. But one particular example that I would like to refer to and uh, that my colleague, uh, Mr. Fabrizio Zorconi would actually present in the next panel, is the uh, large scale funding program that Poland is implementing to improve air quality, but also to um, tackle energy efficiency. So this is a huge financial operation uh, in which the bank is providing just a small share of the financing. However, we are supporting uh, with the uh, knowledge and advice, the design and implementation of the entire program, which is scaling up, uh, I think uh, about 3 billion euro uh, yeah, which is a massive investment in uh, air quality improvement uh, in most polluted Polish cities. Uh, so World Bank is uh, supporting um, um, identification of the uh, interventions, uh, support to, to the local level authorities to implement these um, policy interventions. But let me not uh, share more because uh, Fabrizio will be uh, already presenting some, some elements of this problem in the next panel. Thank you very much. Tout à fait, je suis ravi de, de constater que la Bulgarie sert d'exemple. Thank you. This was an, an excellent response to the question. I'm happy to hear that Bulgaria has served as an example to other countries. This is a very good practice for Bulgaria. This is a wonderful example 
And uh, it shows that uh, Bulgaria is able to implement very effective programs that give inspiration to other countries. Thank you. Now, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Milova. Uh, we will um, allow other participants to ask questions. Personally, I will also make a presentation. We are a little bit behind. That is why I will try to present my slides quickly. The topic is how to tackle air pollution at national, regional, and company level. In order to integrate various issues and various problems in waste management, transportation, in cities, we have where we are working on all these issues and we should point out that we are also we also we are uh, the operators for environmental protection in France our focus is mainly mainly revolves around the and national institutions, the regional institutions and administrations related to air quality, uh, the energy, as well as transition, using various tools like communication. We are members of a large network the Transborder Convention. It has very active participation in the activities of this uh, protocol. We uh, also, we are an accredited organization by the United Nations and the European Air Convention, as well as other groups of experts. Here is a map. You can see uh, our activities in different locations across the world, about 20 of them. We are also authorized to uh, work on issues related to transition in other countries, uh, which uh, th this type of activity is not funded. We uh, look for other sources of funding for all those projects, different agencies and other donors. Uh, around Bulgaria, we've worked in Serbia, in Croatia. We talk about various air pollution issues that we have come across. Uh, you are well familiar with all these topics, what Mr. Klinkenberg di displayed and showed you and talked about. Uh, this is also mentioned in my briefing. I would like to draw your attention to two software tools. One is called RISC. Which allows a transparent uh, communication and um, inventory at local level. And the other tool is called Mimosa. This allows uh, car fleet scenarios in cities and uh, depicts the emissions from traffic. And very quickly, this is a technical slide. I will go on to the next one. Risk that I mentioned. This is a tool that we use in France to do inventory of pollutants. And also we provide advice 
and consultation. This is a very effective tool. We have, uh, we have established it in about 10 countries. And we not only expanded its operation, but we also adapted it to the conditions in various countries. I will briefly present you a video which will uh, give you an idea how the software and this application works. It covers both greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutant emissions. Risk is based on our experience in conducting French inventories, but adjusts to the needs and capabilities of each user. So, uh, Risk Software Solution allows any country, city, or territory to manage its entire inventory. These calculations are carried out within Excel files and And it also covers both green uh, greenhouse gases and air pollutant emissions. In each of these files, Quality monitoring can guide, verify. Risk is based on our experience of French inventories. When the work to These calculations are done in Excel files, incorporating specifics in various areas and territory. In each of these files, we see the quality control, which can guide, verify, and validate the work that is done on a daily basis. This work and all this data is then centralized in a central access database. This is how we can generate uh, charts and graphs that can be used directly in various reports by various experts. RISC also offers the possibility to manage several inventories in parallel. And this also uh, meets all the requirements of the framework for enhanced transparency adopted during the Paris Agreement. The introduction of the RISC software. I would like to also present you you can uh, see a more detailed presentation of risk on the next slide. Here you see the various sources of pollution. And uh, they have been, you can see them described on, uh, on the left, uh, and you can see some of the calculations on the right. Uh, this is done by various uh, reports. All the reports are transparent. And they are designed not only to, uh, to, to give a, an account of all the gases, the greenhouse gases, but also the other pollutants. On the next slide, you can see the invent how the results are inventorized. It is important to point out, uh, to say a few words about the second tool. It is called Mimosa. It was developed in France by the ministry uh, that is in charge of ecology. It allows to regulate and control certain areas uh, for priority, uh, for priority zones for air quality. And this is this is a tool designed for those people for those uh, that take decisions and allow also uh, to make decisions in various areas. We we uh, we consider serious uh, a series of scenarios. 
And we also make hypotheses. What would be the effect by temporarily uh, removing some of the vehicles from certain areas and what would be the impact if that measure is not taken? Because we believe that uh, they account for 54% of the emissions. We can also uh, make another choice. There's, there are other options. We can uh, focus our attention to diesel vehicles only. We can also direct it to the registration number of the vehicles. Also, we can also adapt it. We can adapt these calculations depending on uh, the local ability to react and take measures. And this can correspond to each different situation. I will not dwell in uh, more details about the capabilities that we offer with the system. I would rather answer your questions. And now I will give the floor if there are no questions to demonstrate a tool which is uh, which is uh, a tool called Metron. Mr. Detros, he will say a few words to begin with. Thank you, Mr. Bouton, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, I will be brief as we are a little bit ahead of, uh, um, behind of schedule, sorry. The um, solution that we would like to present in a couple of minutes, and I am making it better for you, should be okay now, um, is a solution that is dedicated to the measurement um, of energy consumption. And by energy, we talk about fuel, we talk about gas, we talk about electricity. As you know, the energy consumption in the um, public sector and in the building sector is one of the major uh, contributors to air pollution. And therefore we have developed at Metron a specific software solution allowing municipalities, public players, but also industrial to follow up precisely the energy consumption they have in the different sites. And the solution that I am now presenting to you in, in a few words is currently used both in France, in Belgium and in Canada by roughly 10,000 different buildings. The idea is to be able to aggregate all your buildings, it might be municipalities, it might be schools, hospitals, sport infrastructure, doesn't matter, and to collect the uh, energy consumption data. This collect uh, or collect data collection can be done uh, either by the energy invoices or by smart meters or by manual input of the data. And all these consumptions will be automatically converted into either euro or CO2 emission, or it could be any other air pollutant uh, emission that can be computed by the, by the system. The ID and the navigation throughout this uh, interface is very easy. You then just click on one site or two sites or all a group of sites to allow you to make very quick comparison and benchmark of either the cost or the energy performance or the uh, CO2 emissions. You can have a look very quickly at CO2 data, both the monitoring and the uh, objectives in terms of kilowatt hour or ton of CO2 per square meter per building per type of sector, doesn't matter. You can have a look at the energy mix, whether the uh, electricity is coming from um, the, the grid or from photovoltaic installations or from any other systems. You very easily can have a look at the global energy consumption of the different sites and the idea is really to allow you to benchmark sites, 
to assess who are the good ones and who are the bad ones and to use the best practices that you can find in the bad in the good side sorry and implement them in the uh, in the worst performing sites this tool has been developed now for the last uh, 20 years almost it's been improving all over the years and as i said it's currently used in different countries and different regions uh, by different public and private players so if you have any question i won't be longer for my demo but if you have any question feel free to ask them and i will be pleased to uh, to answer that right now if uh, if interest for that mr bouton i give you back the floor Merci, M. Détro. Euh, donc, euh, je regarde dans le, dans le fil de discussion. Vous avez avis, Gospodin Détros? Yes. Est-ce qu'on peut, avec ce système, coupler euh, le, un bon pilotage de la consommation d'énergie avec un pilotage de, des émissions résultant du, du process ou des process? Est-ce qu'on peut faire les deux choses, coupler l'énergie et optimiser à la fois de l'énergie et... et euh, et optimiser euh, des émissions. Is it possible to, to view the consumption of energy? Yes, the, 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 as the, well the, as the, uh, pollution. So the, 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 the question is if it's possible to see both energy consumption, production data, and uh, emission of pollutants. Yes, definitely you can combine those information and our solution goes one step behind because by use of artificial intelligence, we are able to optimize the process and to tell you what was the best settings for your factory or for the site to reduce the energy consumption and produce the maximum of product that you want to produce. There is no interpretation into Bulgarian. I apologize. Um, so the, the, the question is about uh, the metering. Uh, the question is how, how, how is this achieved? How was this yeah. done? Well, in, in, in the public buildings, we usually take only the invoices or the main meters. That means that we don't need to add additional sensors or um, Internet of Things sensor or captors or meters on specific sites. If we are talking about industrials, then we will probably need to put some additional sensors for fuel, for uh, uh, temperature, for pressure, for flow, all these kind of measurement can be added onto the system, but we have some small sites where we do not install anything. Uh, it's just based upon the invoices. The, the first added value of the tool is that it allows you to organize and to aggregate the data from hundreds, if not thousands of sites. If you want to go deeper into detail, of course, that will request uh, sensors that then can be connected to the internet and all data will be forwarded to our system, which is a web-based application. Thank you very much. Mr. Detros? I do not see any uh, other questions to Ms. Eolina Milova. Now I will give the floor 
représente la Banque européenne du climat, Monsieur Radonov. Je vous laisse la parole. To Mr. Radonov. Uh, he will speak about financing. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, Madam Ambassador, Prime, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Sandov. Uh, special thanks uh, to the uh, French uh, Embassy for arranging this webinar on uh, uh, air quality because uh, the quality of air is uh, definitely a very important factor in uh, human health. And I hope uh, uh, this particular aspect should be evaluated properly in any investment that is to be put into the uh, into uh, the country. Air pollution, unfortunately, continues to be the main threat to human health and the environment. It is also an important factor in, uh, uh, in uh, people's health, especially in uh, the uh, fragile health uh, ecosystem. And here, the European Bank uh, is a partner to the Commission to achieve the goals. As a European Climate Bank, uh, our group supports uh, uh, the implementation of the Green Deal via the entire set of financial tools and consultancy services. Back in 2019, in accordance with the political ambition of greening Europe, Europe, the uh, managing director of uh, European Investment Bank has uh, taken a commitment regarding the, uh, the environment. First, all our projects need to comply with the Paris Agreement. Secondly, by 2025, 50% of our investment should be directed to sustainable uh, environment. And the third part refers, the third point refers to, uh, to seizing any funding for old fashioned energy sources. Furthermore, we intend to raise 1 trillion billion euro. The world, uh, the European Investment Bank actually succeeded in raising uh, half of uh, those uh, funds. So we have uh, um, fulfilled uh, our commitment four years earlier. Uh, the results indicate uh, that uh, the Bulgarian uh, the Bulgarian uh, approach uh, needs to be uh, deployed. The European Union has 75% more patents in that area and four times more than China. That's why regarding green technology, Europe is the leader. And parallel to that, less than 10% of global emissions are produced in Europe. And in that sense, the bank will continue to support that commission in order to implement the Green Deal and to continue develop it and continue be the leader in this area. I want to give you some examples regarding projects in Bulgaria. The first project we have uh, signed a contract, uh, 60 million euro with Sofia municipality, with the EIB uh, funds, the Sofia municipality will be able to set up uh, a sustainable and uh, a resilient uh, um, environmentally friendly transportation system in the urban 
a part of the city. The second example, which is actually a highlight, uh, we signed a contract uh, with uh, the flag fund for 25 million euro. Uh, fund flag is uh, adding uh, additional 25 million euro. In fact, it comes uh, it comes uh, to 50 million euro. So we have the resources. And there are many investments uh, regarding upgrading uh, systems, uh, urban system, um, urban transport, uh, upgrading and reconstructing uh, various municipal buildings uh, uh, so as to reduce uh, the footprint on environment. Uh, colleagues uh, will be present uh, in the next uh, uh, panel and they will be able to give uh, more examples on that. Last but not least, I want to mention a platform uh, that uh, very recently was uh, launched. The idea behind the platform uh, is to support to support banks or uh, counterparts, uh, the uh, the environmental aspect to evaluate the environmental aspect of uh, uh, the project and uh, um, uh, assess uh, the impact uh, on uh, environment. And I believe uh, that uh, this uh, will uh, allow. <coughs> To um, this will allow to have uh, this project uh, implemented. EIB uh, remains at your disposal for any type of services. Uh, we are prepared to consider any project available and consult on projects. So don't hesitate to contact us and we'll do our best to help. Thank you once again for this invitation and for the very timely webinar. If any questions arise, I'm here to respond. Merci, Monsieur Radonov, pour ce programme très ambitieux et déjà bien engagé. Thank you very much, Monsieur Radonov. This is a very interesting topic. I had asked all the questions to be asked in English so that I can uh, I can give you the answer. I can give the question as well as uh, allow you to respond. One question for Mr. Radonov. Uh, who, who has the right to ask for funding? Is it uh, the people who are the decision makers, those who take decisions, the governments, the regional administrations, who can request funding from the investment bank? Thank you for this question. We need to mention here that uh, we work with governments as well, with different ministries. We also work with municipalities, with the private sector as well, banks as well, with the venture capital funds, so we can say almost everyone, depending on uh, the uh, nature of the project, if, uh, if I uh, can formulate it in this way. If you have uh, more specific ideas or questions, then I might respond uh, in detail. Merci. Just donc, qu'appelle-t-on projet? Est-ce qu'un projet, c'est nécessairement un projet d'équipement? Thank you very much. What do you call a project? Does this project need to include a purchase of materials, of goods, equipment? Or can it be also design 
for programming software for some um, I, projects related to ideas in order to tackle these questions. It can be about design, about programming, modeling, but of course, depending on the size of the project, uh, it could uh, be considered directly by uh, EIB teams, uh, for instance, over 15 million euro. If they are smaller, we need to go through our intermediaries. If we're talking about uh, uh, venture capital or uh, debt financing, Thank you. It is clear. If you can stay until the end of the webinar, that would be great. There may be more questions. I will now give the floor to the next speaker, Mr. Fabrizio Zarconi who will uh, who, who is a representative of the, of the World Bank and present World Bank uh, positions and ideas. Thank you very much and um, good afternoon everyone. If uh, we can put the um, presentation on the screen, please. In the meantime, uh, let me thank the EU uh, presidency of uh, France and uh, particularly Ambassador Robin for her sensibility to these matters and for organizing this excellent event. Um, before I start, uh, um, um, I would like to uh, um, highlight uh, that the World Bank is deeply committed uh, towards um, um, uh, climate change or fight against the climate change and strategies, policies, and um, investments. Um, the bank has been, uh, last year, the bank has been uh, um, financing around the $26 billion uh, in projects uh, around the world. And it's particularly committed here in Bulgaria, as uh, my colleague, uh, Eulina was mentioning earlier in working with the Ministry of Environment and other agencies to support uh, uh, the fight against climate change and uh, um, the air quality improvement uh, in the in the country. Uh, this uh, this this uh, these issues are also the main pillar, one of the main pillars of our partnership with the, with the government of Bulgaria, and we look forward to continue working on, uh, on this. Um, let's uh, uh, change slide, please. Uh, well, this was the initial slide. So let's move to the following one. Um, so, um, as you can see from uh, this slide, before talking about financing, uh, we need to understand why we are financing. And uh, the study that um, um, Eulina and the team uh, undertook uh, at the World Bank in collaboration with the Ministry of Environment uh, tell us that there is a large uh, funding gap from the implementation of the um, air quality uh, program and air quality measures. Uh, particularly related to uh, residential um, heating. Um, as you can see uh, from uh, the graph, um, in order to uh, uh, fulfill uh, the measures of, uh, under the National Air Quality Improvement Program, uh, the, uh, the country will need around 850 uh, um, uh, million dollars, um, sorry, um, leva. Um, now, some of the resources are available through uh, the budget of the country, um, but also through the different EU mechanisms, uh, either through the uh, uh, operational program or the recovery and the resilience uh, fund, which, we, uh, which are going to support the green uh, transition. 
Uh, some of them uh, can be available relatively uh, quickly through the budget, uh, around the 20 million, as the minister mentioned earlier, um, around 20 million dollars. Um, and uh, others, uh, uh, when uh, uh, after the acceptance of the RRP or through the operational program. But we are talking here about um, a bit less than 100 million dollars. Uh, the gap uh, is still very uh, big. So um, according to our preliminary assessments, uh, there are um, other um, amounts that need to be uh, collected, found by uh, Bulgaria in order to uh, um, start financing the different measures. Uh, to improve air quality in the country. Um, uh, let's change slide, please. Um, here, um, my colleagues uh, uh, previously mentioned about uh, uh, the role of EIB, for example, but IFIs, uh, uh, we all have uh, uh, a different role to, to play. Uh, in the case of the, the World Bank, uh, for example, this slide indicates um, a bit the uh, financing instruments uh, available in order to uh, um, have results and impact. Uh, the first set of uh, measures are mm, uh, uh, it, it represent financing to the government. Um, the resources, however, can uh, go to local authorities, uh, municipalities, through a World Bank uh, and uh, government uh, guarantees. Um, so uh, the resources can easily trickle down to the municipalities through an agreement uh, with the government of Bulgaria. Um, the first one is the uh, investment project financing. Um, it's uh, a lending operation, a lending activity for activities that create uh, uh, infrastructure, but also um, um, soft uh, um, knowledge uh, <clears throat> necessary to reduce poverty and create a sustainable environment. Um, the a second one, uh, uh, slightly more flexible, is the development policy financing, uh, because it provides lending support through uh, reforms. Um, sorry, can we move again? Um, thanks. Um, uh, through, uh, um, I was saying, uh, budget support uh, uh, through the recognition of a series of uh, reforms that uh, the country takes place. And this is a way to build the capacity to strengthen uh, systems and environment uh, and uh, achieve uh, a shared prosperity and, and poverty reduction. Uh, the third one, uh, which I would like you to focus a bit more, is called the program for result. It is a lending operation, but uh, disbursement of the financial resources of World Bank funds are di directly linked to uh, specific results. They are uh, progressively measured uh, uh, during the life of, uh, of the project. And um, so throughout the life, which is usually longer than uh, uh, normal investment lending projects, um, the bank and the government have the opportunity to strengthen institutions and to build the capacity um, uh, along the different agencies that collaborate. Uh, additional modalities are uh, with the intervention of uh, the private sector arms of uh, the World Bank, uh, the International uh, Finance Corporation, uh, which provides lending to uh, and, and advisory support to the private sector, but also through the multilateral investment guarantee agencies that provides uh, um, guarantees. Um, <clears throat> let's move to the last slide, which uh, I think it is really uh, um, exemplary of, uh, of the way the World Bank has been working uh, in the in the months and years to um, in, 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 the, in, in the past months and years and um, how it's implementing projects in the future. 
Um, the, this uh, project, uh, this is uh, an infograph of a Monsieur project. Zarconi, je vais oui, je, te, je vais terminer tout de suite. En, uh, en une minute. Oui, merci, je vais terminer tout de suite. Um, my colleague Olina was mentioning the Poland uh, uh, program. Uh, this is a program for result, as I was uh, mentioning, in the amount of uh, 250 million dollars, uh, but is uh, a project that define and structure a reform that is then able to leverage uh, uh, around 26 billion doll uh, dollars over 10 years. So it's a massive reform um, uh, initiated by the Polish uh, government and, uh, and the World Bank that it will also leverage public funds from the EU, from the government and from the private sector. Um, can we change the slide, please? So this was uh, the infograph I was talking about. Um, so the, as you can see, if, can you, um, show the whole, no, 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 back, please. Can you show the full uh, uh, slide because it, uh, it uh, doesn't show certain uh, elements? Well, it has disappeared. Anyway, while uh, um, the slide appears, um, Okay, that, that's fine. Um, so uh, if, if the presentation is sent uh, uh, to the participants, you will see. Uh, um, so through these $250 million, we will be able to also to mobilize private capital for uh, more than $1.5 billion and uh, uh, European resources. This is in, in great, uh, this is to respond to great needs to, of, of the country. Um, 36 out of 50 among the most polluted uh, cities in, Pol uh, in Europe, sorry, are uh, in Poland. The program is going to uh, support uh, um, the, um, uh, through subsidies and tax uh, relief, uh, the thermal retrofitting and boilers replacement in 3 million single family uh, buildings and benefiting therefore 2.8 million citizens with cleaner and sustainable heating. We are in a geopolitical time that is very complex and the project will also allow energy efficiency that is so fundamental in the days to come, not only for Poland, but for all uh, European countries. I'll stop here. Um, I think the infograph, um, uh, infographic deserves a bit more attention, but I will be happy to respond to questions. Thank you. Mais c'était très intéressant, évidemment. Uh, Thank you very much. This was a very interesting presentation. And naturally, we would have preferred to hear, to listen to you more. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. We can see that only in the area of heating, uh, domestic heating, it is necessary more than 400 million euros. So who conducts, who decides? Who, who decides how the measures are complementing one another? Because in order to achieve a result, we need to achieve certain parameters. And each parameter responds to a certain tool. Who decides who is the conductor for all these instruments to play together so that the final goal is achieved? Who is the person in charge? 
who is the who is the conductor conducting this orchestra or maybe the uh, or maybe the governments and the municipalities uh, work with each tool individually um, uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, uh, Monsieur Boutang. Um, well, I, I, I wish uh, the, there was only one director uh, as uh, to manage the orchestra, uh, but clearly this is more of uh, under spirit of cooperation. Certainly there is an agency that leads uh, the work and, and, and usually and uh, uh, it is the Ministry of Environment in collaboration with the Ministry of uh, Finance. Uh, this is what is happening in uh, in um, um, in Poland, that, that, um, meaning a technical ministry uh, together with the, uh, uh, a ministry in charge for the for the finance. And then um, this is done in collaboration with the World Bank Group, with the technicians of the World Bank Group in the establishment on a joint establishment uh, through a team of the different uh, indicators that are going to um, allow us to understand when a result is achieved and when an additional re uh, disbursement uh, uh, is going to be needed. Um, so th this is, would be the answer in a nutshell. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. Does the World Bank does the World Bank determine whether whether we should prioritize the replacement of uh, of space heaters, or we should uh, we should focus our attention to thermal iso insulation of the buildings? Who decides whether the emphasis should be on the insulation of buildings or, for instance, the replacement of space heaters? Or uh, is this determined by each uh, member state regarding uh, in, and in, in compliance with their plans and priorities? or whether priority should be given to the purchase of new space heaters or to insulate uh, more and more buildings. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Monsieur Boutang. Uh, the, uh, these are um, uh, political and economic decisions taking, taken by the member states. Uh, the role of the World Bank is mainly a technical and analytical role. So according to the decision taken by the member state, uh, the World Bank provides the uh, instruments uh, uh, for the results to be uh, reached. Certainly, uh, the same analytical uh, studies can, uh, um, um, can um, provide advice to government on the decisions to be taken. So um, it could be uh, in, uh, in parallel, uh, the change of the eaters and at the same time uh, uh, in a more limited amount of uh, 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 residential uh, buildings uh, to insulate. Uh, clearly, the the uh, objectives are slightly different because it is true that if insulate buildings, we will uh, uh, consume less heating and then pollute less. But probably by changing the heaters in such a massive way, like in the Polish case, uh, we uh, we can be able to uh, uh, reduce air pollution in a very substantive uh, way more than. Uh, the isolation, but um, I think these are also measures that uh, should take place uh, uh, um, should should take place at the same time. It is a matter of financing at the end of the day, and a matter of reforms and willingness uh, to push the reforms. But again, 
Uh, as I said earlier, I think that if we had some flexibility in Europe in the past, the geopolitical situation doesn't allow us to have more uh, flexibility and to postpone these reforms. So the two elements that you um, that you mentioned should go in parallel. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, the answer. We really appreciate that. We may come back to these issues. Now I give the floor to Ms. Anka Ionesco. She's from the, uh, develop the Reconstruction and Development Bank. For inviting the BRD to this interesting webinar and giving us a chance to present our Green Cities framework. I would like to start with a small uh, clip, uh, a movie about uh, the framework, and then I promise I will deliver only five minutes presentation. Thank you very much. I'm Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia has some of the worst air pollution in the world. But the city is developing a more sustainable future as part of EBRD Green Cities. Our cities face enormous climate and environmental challenges. We at EBRD built EBRD Green Cities to help our cities identify these challenges and then find sustainable solutions together. From Central Asia to the Southern Mediterranean, cities across regions are signing up. Being an EBRD Green City is important for Amman. Green Cities to me means for the city to become sustainable we need also to cater for what the citizens would want, what are their aspirations from the city, what are the main challenges that they are facing in their daily life that's affecting them. Amman is already addressing some of its urban challenges, such as solid waste. But they hope, as an EBRD green city, they can achieve even more. Like Amman, the Viv is also tackling challenges related to solid waste. We are on the stage of the solution of one of the most important issues that is in our city. This is the connection with the students with the students. Once a city has signed up to the program, they co-develop a green city action plan with a broad range of stakeholders. The action plan provides a blueprint for investments in areas such as clean transport, in Banja Luka, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, residents can already feel the difference that becoming an EBRD green city makes. I Wood chips, sustainably sourced from the local area, are being used to power the city's district heating plant. When you look at Russia, I think it's about 20.000 tons of wood. And this is the system. We have a clean city, a green city, 
u kom koristimo isključivo obnovljivi izvor energije i imamo stabilno i kvalitetno grijanje. The city is now looking at making the system even more efficient using thermal drone images to map and reduce heat loss. Across regions, EBRD Green Cities is creating a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. And I would like, if it's possible now to put the presentation, it will be very, very short. Um, so we started uh, this uh, Green Cities framework uh, in 2016. And uh, at that moment, we realized that, uh, that um, uh, the cities represent uh, uh, around 50% of the global population. And um, uh, also in the cities, uh, 75%. Can we move to the first slide, please? Um, so in the cities, 75% uh, of the energy consumptions and 70% of the green emission. So we realize that cities have a central role and a key responsibility in addressing the, the climate change issues. Uh, in, and in this respect, EBRD uh, uh, created a platform that put together the cities Cities, the policy maker, the technical expertise, and the funding to address the climate change in a systemic and comprehensive way. So um, let's move to the next slide, please. So we created this 5 billion framework uh, for all the cities in our countries uh, of operation uh, to support the cities to identify, benchmark, and prioritize investments uh, in the cities in order to improve the environmental uh, performance of these cities. So uh, basically, the program delivery uh, is delivering strategy and policy support by engaging with the governments and policy makers. It's uh, facilitating and uh, stimulating uh, infrastructure investments. And here we are looking to all the aspects of one city uh, through uh, urban transport, district heating, energy efficiency, uh, waste management, um, um, digitalization and smart solution. And we also aim to build capacity uh, at the city administration level and uh, supporting access to finance uh, once the green action plan is uh, it's ready. Let's move to the next uh, slide. So uh, what are the eligibility criteria to enroll in green city, uh, uh, in green city uh, framework? First of all, the city should be in our countries of operation. We are uh, covering 39 countries currently and the entire uh, um, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria is included, to have at least 100 inhabitants and to have a trigger green project. This trigger project is not to make business. You will see that our projects are very small in size, but to ensure the same level of commitment. So if we, um, if we uh, provide grant funding and we engage consultants, we do not want to face a situation where the city is in the middle of the process says, okay, we don't want to, to, to move forward anyway. And we have an approach that it's integrated. So we look into all aspects of, uh, of uh, uh, how a city is functioning. And we try to build resilience, to incorporate the smart technologies, to integrate the renewables um, uh, in the district heating, and of course, to engage public uh, private sector where it's possible. And we developed also a policy toolkit that I will uh, uh, discuss at the end. Let's move next slide, please. Okay, so what, what we do? So we have a trigger project with one municipality, and then we engage consultants. Usually it's a consortium of consultants because um, they need to have very different areas of expertise. First, they start to collect data because indeed many speakers before me told that there is no reliable data in all the aspects of, of, uh, of, uh, of the city. And we create a baseline and we do a benchmark 
and then we identified for each aspect uh, uh, of the functioning of the city, what action should be done, what measures should be taken, what investments, and what is this uh, investment impact uh, in overall uh, environment, uh, in, uh, the impact in environment. And then we prioritize and we create a green action plan with priority, uh, priority investments um, and uh, give, it, um, give it to the city. Uh, 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 usually we ask that this green action plan, it is uh, discussed and we have a quite a comprehensive uh, public consultation where we engage with the government, we engage with the NGOs, we engage with the citizens and all the market participants to build support for all this, uh, for all these investments. Once this uh, public consultation is done, uh, the green action plan is uh, submitted to the city council and hopefully approved by the city council. So what are the benefits for the municipalities, for the cities? First of all, they have uh, access to technical expertise. We, fi we finance this technical expertise uh, via uh, grant funding that is coming from our donors. There is a large support for the for the green action plan via very uh, well uh, run uh, public consultation. Uh, they will have access to a priority investment plan approved by the city council, and this is very important because then they will not have to approve project by project moving forward. And this will give them access to concessional financing, to green financing uh, that usually uh, they receive better terms. And they have a readiness uh, pool of project that um, can absorb grants from various uh, EU funded programs. Let's move to the Madame Ionescu, I will ask you to conclude in one minute, if possible. Yes. So basically, you see, these are the cities that we uh, we have in the program. It's heartbreaking because you will see that there are five cities in Ukraine and two of them are probably now fully destroyed, Mariupol and Kharkov. And I will go very rapidly to the to the cities in Bulgaria. Let's move. Uh, let's move uh, to the next uh, slide, please. So uh, one of the first cities that enrolled in our Green Cities um, uh, program was Sofia, who joined uh, us in 2018. As an, um, a trigger project, we had a very interesting um, project in electrici uh, electrification of the uh, public transport. We uh, uh, funded together with the Energy Special Fund uh, 30 electric buses and uh, 12 uh, charging stations. We are very happy because the GCAP was uh, adopted in December 2020, and now uh, the, the city is moving forward with the implementation of the investment plan, and we can move forward. Um, uh, uh, the second city that joined, uh, uh, joined our program is Varna. Uh, the GCAP, uh, the action plan is ready. Uh, there we had a very interesting climate resilience infrastructure project. And again, um, we uh, put um, in place uh, uh, 31 electric uh, charging stations. Um, and we hope that the GCAP uh, will be uh, adopted uh, by June this year. <coughs> Let's move to the to the next slide, please. Sorry for this. Uh, so um, uh, none of this uh, uh, would be uh, available without the support uh, from our uh, sponsors. Um, here you have. Um, Till now, we um, uh, we uh, deployed uh, around 300 million in donor support to all these cities. And the last slide, I would like to encourage you if you are interested to look into this EBRD Green Cities um, uh, site because there we have a, uh, um, a policy um, uh, tool and we put a lot of thinking and effort in creating it. And you will see uh, cities around the globe with their challenges and the projects and how they, they found the, uh, the solutions. So that's it, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Madame Ionescu. C'était très riche comme... Uh... Thank you very much, Ms. Ionesco. Uh, you shared valuable experience. Perhaps one question? 
you spoke about about the way of uh, the, the uh, you spoke about a group of experts who determine the priorities before the plan of action is uh, developed is it possible to tell us where these experts come from are they are these experts from the member state or these are uh, experts from a european network that go from city to city and provide advice and consultation thank you yes thank you very much for the for the for the question uh, so basically the the green action plan is not and the priorities are not defined uh, at the very beginning um, these technical experts um, are coming from all our countries of operation so this is a policy of uh, of ebrd uh, the majority of them are um, coming from uh, from eu of course uh, and uh, they have uh, different uh, specialities. So we have uh, urban transport experts, uh, district heating experts, uh, waste management experts, and they come and analyze and they just propose to the city and explain, look, this is these are the areas um, uh, that you have big problems. Um, these are uh, the benchmarks, how and the best practices. And these are uh, type of investment investments that you can undertake to address these problems. And um, there is an interactive um, discussion we have uh, with uh, the team from the municipality and uh, the priority investment list is, is prepared. And then this is uh, subject to public consultation. I think this is very important. Uh, this It's a very important step in the process to really engage uh, with everybody and, uh, and, uh, and come to a conclusion. A conclusion. Uh, just to mention that this uh, green action plan is available for everybody. It is a public document and can be consulted. And uh, we hope to, you know, to 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 mobilize all our colleagues, all our, all our IFIs uh, in Bulgaria and uh, and also the private sector in addressing all these issues. Merci, Madame Ionescu. Autre question. Non, oui, beaucoup de rien. Thank you very much, Miss Ionescu. Vous avez parlé, vous avez évoqué un, euh, l'aide stratégique de façon à ce que les. You talked about strategic assistance for the creation of action plans. Is this assistance, in other words, uh, is the strategy building financed or, or the strategy is uh, sort of created, built before the plan is worked out by, and, the, and this in conjunction with other experts? Uh, the strategy and the plan is created and then of course uh, there is a list of investments that need to be uh, uh, to be put in place um, all the ifis they have programs and um, uh, we have very good financial instruments to address these issues um, we have concessional uh, concessional lending uh, there is a green deal that is coming that can be used for this. Uh, for this, we can also um, uh, very interesting. We can expand our uh, assistance and give assistance to municipality to issue green bonds or uh, sustainable linked bonds that are uh, much cheaper on the market and um, to to finance these investments. So uh, basically, it's uh, the strategy and the plan come first, and of course, then comes uh, the investment. That the cities decide by themselves how they want to fund them but there is plenty of uh, of grants and uh, financial instruments from all all ifis and uh, and commercial banks to address them Merci. Um, également, par Thank exemple, j'ai cité la, la vidéo site, le cas de Daniel Luca, 
You also mentioned the uh, case of Banya Luka. Who identified that, who determined that Banya Luka needs assistance? Is it the bank? Did the bank make this decision? Or there is an application filed by a certain city and they uh, send in this application to the bank and request assistance. Who takes the decision and what is the procedure? So uh, the procedure is quite simple. Of course, having this framework, we market this framework to all the cities in the countries of operation. And uh, then the decision is uh, resides with, uh, with the municipality if they want to enroll in this program or not, because uh, you see it's uh, also resource intensive uh, from their part. Even if they don't put the money, they will put the effort and they will have to, to follow through. And um, for example, Sofia, they signed up in May 2018 and the plan and everything was ready in uh, December 2020. So it, it is a very laborious process, but because it's very comprehensive, but it's a, it's a fantastic exercise for all the municipalities they want to be part of, part of this because of the technical expertise that is coming and uh, because of the coherent approach that we have. Merci beaucoup. Je, je suis sûr qu'il y aurait beaucoup de. Thank de you. Questions. I'm sure that there are more questions. But I don't see any in the chat. Thank you very much, Monsieur Nesco. We shall now proceed. I will now give the floor to Mr. Uh, David Delgado and he will talk to us about um, uh, what they do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bhutan, um, and good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to start uh, thank you, thanking the, the, ambas the embassy for the invitation, but also the, the ambassadress for her initiative. And despite the, the sad news that we have these days and the current uh, war situation that we have nearby Bulgaria, uh, keeping, keeping the program. I think we have seen uh, with the presentation of our colleagues how the air pollution is very much linked to the energy transition and the sustainability. But I also wanted to, to make a reference that these topics are also very much uh, related to the energy independency of uh, cities and countries in the European Union. And I think that, that we need to continue these efforts to, to move into this direction. If we can proceed to my presentation, I'm very aware of the challenge of timing that we have, and I will ask you to move directly to slide four, please. Yeah, perfect. I, I just wanted a quick reminder. Meridian is is a developer, as in as he is an investor in sustainable infrastructure. We are a, a mission company under French law, which is the equivalent of well-known benefit corporation uh, certification that we have uh, in Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, I wanted to present first of all, which are our five strategic pillars of investment very, very quickly. The first one is related to resilience, which is key for the discussion that we have today. The second one is energy transition, as I was mentioning, also very much related to it. The third one is uh, reducing emissions uh, related very related to, cl to climate action, uh, also very much linked to our purpose today. Our fourth pillar is to promote uh, good conditions for work. And our fifth pillar is the protection of the biodiversity. All of these within the context of us being an investor in, in sustainable infrastructure. If we move to page eight, uh, just to give you a flavor of the things that we, in which we invest, uh, we have three areas in which we invest uh, today globally in three continents in Europe, 
Africa and the Americas is uh, critical public services. And, and you see here is primarily hospitals, schools, and any kind of public administration buildings. We have a second axe of uh, investment that is related to mobility uh, and the mean of transportation with a very focus on sustainability and all initiatives that might be related to low carbon emissions and this transition uh, to, low, to low carbon uh, economy. Then I will, I will jump directly into page 10, 11 to present the, the Urban Resilient Fund, which is uh, the instrument that relates uh, to, to the initiative that we have. And I will explain at the end uh, or, or, or hint on the work that we are doing already in Bulgaria. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, a little bit the, the, the situation under which we have developed this initiative. It's, we have identified, in addition to what has been said about cities, uh, this climate change, this economic and demographic uh, challenge that they also have, uh, the gap in financing that we have been identifying. I wanted to focus also in this fourth point, which is uh, there are a lot of barriers that the municipalities are facing to develop these projects. Um, what we are trying to address with uh, this TARF initiative is to tackle these uh, barriers of entry that the municipalities have today into developing themselves uh, these, uh, these projects. We can go to the next slide. Very uh, starting to enter a little bit more into the detail. The, the TARF initiative is uh, focusing on in resilience very largely. This is uh, one of the key concepts is not only providing financing, but providing the expertise of development that Meridium's uh, team can contribute. Um, this is allowing this, pla this platform turf is, a, is allowing us to uh, focus into smaller projects than we would do as a private infrastructure investor uh, otherwise. And we understand that this is, this is key for cities. Um, we are doing, we are, we, are, we are willing to enter into this structuring work with public authorities, uh, which uh, many times is, uh, is difficult for private, for private parties uh, to, to have this kind of cooperation with cities in structuring deals in a way that are attractive for private capital. Um, we are trying to um, find ways uh, in which uh, this uh, could be replicated uh, in, in other places and, and more systematically we can approach uh, projects, uh, the better we'll be satisfying our objectives here. And, and the idea is not to uh, uh, finance single projects, but to develop partnership with municipalities and that we could uh, probably start with one project, but develop programs uh, with the cities to, to, in the long term, being able to address uh, the needs that the, that the cities have. I wanted, to, I wanted to mention that for the case of Bulgaria um, uh, and other countries uh, in, in the region, we have uh, agreed to develop this together with the BRD, and we are working very closely with the the infrastructure project preparation facility, which is a dedicated team that the, the, the EBRD has uh, um, dedicated to cooperating with uh, municipalities for the preparation of uh, infrastructure projects. And if we can go to the last slide, not the next, not the following, not the next one, the following one. Yes. I wanted to conclude. Yeah, we can go to the next one and I will address any questions. The next one, please. Oh, the next one might be, might have been cut it. <laughs> the, I wanted to mention which are, this one, perfect. I wanted to mention which are the five, the five elements that globally the program mm, is trying to tackle with municipalities is urban mobility, is energy transition, 
is uh, buildings under contribution to uh, to sustainability in cities, uh, smart solutions and resource resources management. We have already started uh, analyzing these within the context of the analysis that has been done by EBRD uh, with Sofia uh, in their Green City pro pro program. And we have started working together with the bank into and the municipality of Sofia into some uh, uh, potential projects to make use of the geothermal energy in the city uh, for heating. And, and I, wanted to, I wanted to mention that that's, um, that's the ultimate goal that we have for, with TARF to identify specific projects in which we can start working to ultimately uh, finance and bring them to, into a reality uh, the, sooner, the sooner we can. And uh, Mr. Rutan, I give you back the floor and willing to respond to any questions that you or the audience may have. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Delgado Romero. Thank you greatly, Mr. Delgado. I see that in the chat. Uh, here it says uh, perhaps somebody from the European Commission uh, can. Uh, so the question is who determines the priorities? between the energy efficiency and the replacement of uh, space heaters. Thank you very much, Mr. Delgado. Your intervention goes beyond the topic because we 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 not only you not only provide uh, financing but also expertise. Is it possible to give us an example of, of uh, any barriers or challenges that need to be overcome? Yeah. Something that is an obstacle in this process. Thank you. Uh, merci. The, 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 there are many, and for each uh, city, for each municipality, they are, they are different. But uh, when we are talking about infrastructure, about and about financing of infrastructure. One of the first uh, matters that we find and that all the multilaterals somehow have identified and, and are trying to tackle is um, the lack of capacity in the municipality to tackle long-term matters. And those matter also in which they don't have the human resources to deal with, uh, with the expertise. And we are not only talking about the single expertise, but we are also uh, talking about project management expertise or structuring expertise when, when we are thinking about uh, large and complex processes as the ones that we, that we are having here. It could also be um, financing of, uh, of these uh, initial steps uh, of, of the processes. They're usually they have funds available uh, for the infrastructure themselves, but not necessarily as you were as you were probably uh, trying to point out in some of your questions, Mr. Bhutan, not in the preliminary phases and on the preparatory ones, uh, which are also much um, much uh, much needed. They also have uh, some barriers of interest in terms of timing with uh, some of the long long um, long processes uh, on the legal side and on the regulatory policies that are needed to, to, to put in place to, to bring to reality some of these projects. Those are some of, the, some of those that we have, uh, that we all uh, trying to develop uh, projects uh, face on, on a day-to-day -day basis with, uh, with cities and municipalities with which we cooperate. When you conduct your expertise, is it also possible to train people in the various locations so that 
the people can increase their capacity also to inform the decision makers about what is being done. Yes, at Meridian, but I know it's the case also at the World Bank and other institutions, we have dedicated uh, training programs uh, for public officials. Uh, and this is very important. We believe that this is one of the uh, key elements for facilitating the development of uh, infrastructure. Um, it's not the case for TARF. Uh, the objective for TARF is uh, to, to develop the projects. And what we try to do is we try to leverage on the expertise that locally already exists, because sometimes these expertise ex exist, but needs to be uh, bring into value and framed and, and uh, and a structure under a larger umbrella uh, for it to be uh, functional in, in the process of putting together uh, an infrastructure investment. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes what happens is that cities uh, will only have uh, one go in solving uh, one of these big prob problems that they, that they have, like it's air pollution, uh, then we need to focus on building the, capa the capabilities, so not necessarily on solving the problem, but on sustaining the instruments that we put in place in the long run. Not necessarily structuring them, but being able to uh, cope in the long term with the solutions that are put uh, that are put in place. Then most of our efforts are also focused on the on the long term uh, capacity building at the, at the municipalities. And sometimes this goes along with finding the right, the right, uh, the right partners uh, for them. Merci. Justement, voir son projet. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Justement, pour voir le projet dans sa globalité, de votre expérience, puisque vous citez les objectifs de l'ONU. In order to evaluate and make an assessment of this project. You, uh, so you quoted several arguments related to sustainable development. These objectives are these goals that you uh, preset to yourselves? Do you, do you create these goals? Or are these goals embedded at the very beginning of a project? I want to respond that it's actually both. The, it's uh, most of the cities or some of the cities uh, with whom we work have already some of these targets already defined for themselves. Um, but on top of that, at Meridium, what we are doing uh, is uh, to define a methodology for measuring the evolution uh, and the impact that the infrastructures that we develop and that we build and that we operate, um, the impact that this infrastructure has in, have in these uh, sustainable development goals. And we are very much focused on uh, having uh, objectives ways, objective ways of measuring how these infrastructure are helping uh, these cities to attain uh, the targets that are defined under these uh, sustainable development goals. Merci, oui, il y a quelques précis. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Il y a Thank you greatly. So some, uh, some participants have uh, made comments regarding the priorities. Also about the idea to resolve these uh, issues simultaneously. I'm sure that we would have many more questions, but because our time is limited, 
I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Armand Albergel, who is a representative of ARIA Technologies. He will make a presentation related to uh, their activities. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the organizers and the French Embassy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about what we do. I will try for within 10 minutes to conclude my talk. We have, uh, so ARIA Group is made up of three uh, entities. We have a parent company, ARIA Technologies, which is headquarters in Paris. ARIA Net is in Milan and ARIA de Brazil in Rio. We focus on one single business, ambient, uh, ambient environment. We offer solutions and software related to chronic uh, long-term pollution as well as incidental pollutions. We also deal with measuring the size of wind farms and offer solutions to fight climate change. We, we should point out that we have uh, three, uh, uh, three uh, proposals, of three areas of activities, so cities and uh, municipalities, uh, that's the table on the left, industries in the center, and defense and civil protection center, that is the table on the right. Pour notre implication donc en Europe de l'Est, on a fait une étude en Pologne, on a fait un très gros projet Today, en Roumanie. Uh, we, we, you can see that we have worked in Poland and Romania, and uh, also there is a portion of activity that we do in Kaliningrad. All these are funded by European programs. What I'm going to focus on is this tool. This is what we call ARIA Regional which actually answers three questions. We meet three needs. One is the need for accurate mapping of pollution in real time. Collecting and archiving this data allows us to create historical databases, which allow us conducting epidemiological studies and monitoring indicators and sustainability metrics. The data is indicated by the blue and the red arrows. Also, simultaneously, we also get very precise maps in real time. And this is done by collecting data and merging the collected data, providing the best maps possible. These maps are provided, they can be archived, and they also meet some considerations are related uh, to various uh, 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 hazards or some uh, factors that affect uh, human life. So the, we take these measurements on a daily basis. And what can we do uh, in, in relation to air pollution? We, so this can be done by uh, measuring, by uh, recording uh, different indicators. This can be used uh, uh, by providing uh, simultaneous scenarios that impact emissions. Also, the resulting data can be used uh, in a cost-benefit analysis and thus provide valuable supporting data necessary for decision-making. We should also uh, know the forecast. So a one to three day uh, forecast is done on computers. Uh, this is done at night and the, result is of, uh, the results are available when the work resumes. This is uh, the modeling is done by using photochemical dispersion software that is included in the area area regional. We need to know the quality of the area in uh, the quality of air in that area. And in order to get a good picture, we feed, uh, we use a, an European model and that in turn uh, feeds an international model and uh, then, uh, you know, following that, we can also 
uh, transfer the data to a regional. And we can also come to a city model as well. On the next slide, as we indicated, uh, there is a forecasting model that serves as the first draft that combines the available readings and automatically generates maps by combining the available readings and the physical and chemistry uh, indicators for the uh, different scopes of measurement. Here uh, we see, uh, you can see that after the amendment, the map is more or less the same. We can use these. Uh, you can, uh, as you can see, the map is consistent with the actual readings, and these maps make it possible to identify and monitor hotspots that exceed the regulatory thresholds. Uh, soon, the the, some of the indicators along the border will be changed, and this uh, outlook of the maps will be different depending on the peak uh, uh, readings. What can we do? What can we do to fight this uh, pollution? First of all, we need to find what uh, the, the cause and the root of, uh, of these pollutants are. Uh, the modeling tool can also be used for analytical purposes and to answer questions uh, so that we can find out what is the responsibility of e what is the contribution of the various activities like traffic, industry, residential, etc., in the concentrations for primary and secondary pollution pollutants in that area. Another question is who generates pollution and how much do they generate? You can easily run a software. Uh, uh, and we can uh, we can determine which area pollutes another area and how they impact the other regions. Here you can see uh, you can see how uh, this is a study of several scenarios, and uh, this can be we can take into account some uh, some natural uh, causes or industrial causes, and we can come to uh, to the, we can we can come up with a scenario. And uh, as you can see on the right, uh, here you can see a scenario in Bordeaux, which allows us to see where the, uh, the, 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 the area sticks to the regulations, where they're able to meet the requirements. Uh, so far as uh, pollutants are concerned. I would like to point out that the, we're talking about here about a, a current revolution in our field, which is represented by the rise in prominence and combination of three simultaneous trends. That is the telemetry and the use of satellites, the network of uh, microsensors and recording stations, and the democratization of supercomputers and what we call cloud applications. On the left, you see nitrogen dioxide data uh, from a Tromponi multispectral instrument used on sat on the satellite sentinel and the resolution of the measurement corresponds to a pixel of seven by 3.5 kilometers on the right you see the deployment of a cohort of several hundred microsensors over the city of turin and the first results that allow evaluation of the data and using it to produce high resolution maps with algorithm during using artificial intelligence we get this information this is a pixel of uh, seven by 3.5 uh, kilometers, which is not uh, enough. Uh, so we speak of uh, micro, uh, micro sensors, micro uh, devices, which improve the quality. Uh, this, um, this quality is improved year by year. And uh, we think that the quality is inadequate at this time and it needs to be improved. Uh, this is also used for the correction of maps. Uh, we see various indicators, a lot of data, and uh, we need uh, a large calc uh, evaluation or calculating centers that would allow us to improve this model and to also to improve our scenarios and the quality of these scenarios. Now, uh, if I can have a little time, I would like to, I would like to talk about the uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification. Uh, this is an example of what we can do. Uh, 
for the uh, carbon oxide, the carbon dioxide. You can see how, uh, how so we have, uh, see, here you see two examples of applications of these digital system. The first was, uh, one is an application of, uh, that is intended for the monitoring and reporting verification system of gas emissions for Paris using a method called inverse modeling. It originated in the European climate uh, KIC project and is used in the Paris region. So uh, how it works, it allows us to, uh, to come up with the various uh, 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 diagrams with the reference uh, uh, readings and measurements. Here we see that uh, we see less uh, generation of uh, carbon dioxide. I will not show you the video because uh, uh, apologies for that. Well, I was hoping that uh, actually I will I will just provide you the link so you can see the video for yourself. Here, what you see is uh, the model of uh, a, at a large scale. I thank you very much. Uh, I'm also at your disposal for any questions you may have. I hope that uh, there will be questions. Thank you, Armand. I have a question. Does ARIA does ARIA apply sometimes or systematically measures for a verification of the indicators of the readings that have been received by all these sensors? Yes. Absolutely, all the time. We improve these models continuously, and we do this for several reasons. Because the input data can be incorrect. Also, uh, there are a lot of uh, European programs, I will not quote them here, but they are specifically designed and they have been used for several years for evaluation of these models. And currently, Europe in particular, uh, there are also uh, there are also some forecasts about what can be expected from a certain mo uh, scenario or model and what we cannot expect from that. What and how can we determine? Uh, how can you create a, a map uh, two by two meters with sensors that are 200 meters away? How can you do that? So we use about 100 sensors and using 100 sensors in Paris, we're able to achieve very good quality and very good clarity of the forecasts. Also, when we talk about uh, two meters, uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, unclear or incorrect information. There will be a lot of uncertainties. So we need to dis we, we would have to describe uh, 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 vehicle traffic with a lot of uh, precision. So we would we would need to have more precision in the uh, in uh, the emission. So trees are very porous areas where we can concentrate some of uh, some of the pollutants. Thank you very much. Have you taken also into consideration the dust particles? The, did, you, did you take the dust that has dispersed after it accumulated? There are certain rules that we follow. Which allow, which allow us to re, to 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 resume or to estimate the uh, uh, the dust in suspension that is that has rested on the road for a certain time and then it is dispersed back into the air. Most of these pollutants are also secondary in nature. 
For, thus, we can see some sulfates who were emitted somewhere else, but they came over in Paris because they were uh, deposited a second time. And last question. Is it important this uh, super calculate calculator to be in the city itself, or can it be located at an, uh, somewhere else? Which can be secretly, uh, the, the location of which cannot be disclosed. Or how is that done? It doesn't matter where where the uh, this assessment was carried out and what, where the, that physical location is, where the calculation is being done. But some clients want definitely the calculations to be uh, done by their own uh, devices. They want uh, they want it to be done in a certain way by the devices or machines that they have and maybe the equipment that won the, the tender. Uh, thank you to all the panelists from panel number two. Now we will proceed to the last panel, panel three. We will talk about strategies for depolluting. First, we will uh, hear from Martha Svetkova, who is the acting uh, deputy executive director of, of the operational program environment within the Ministry of Environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, th a special thanks to the British, to the uh, to the French embassy. Thank you very much. Now, if you can please show me the presentation. The topic about improving the ambient air quality is of a special importance. I will wait for the next presentation, the one that is in English. If you can please show that one. Improvement of ambient air quality. Thank you. In the meantime, uh, speaking about the uh, the quality of air, it is important for each member state, not only as uh, a regulatory process and procedure that was started and which is uh, effective in our country, but also in relation to the fact that it also uh, affects human uh, the health of people. And it also, we need improvement of the overall environment, the quality of life of people, and last but not least, the contribution of meeting the European directives, as well as, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, all these contributions. The next slide, please. So uh, within the uh, period uh, 2014 to 2020, Bulgaria for the first time uh, started uh, certain uh, uh, indicators. So initially we, uh, we invested 50 million uh, euro, that's eventually uh, 50,000. Uh, so the, uh, the goal is to address two main sources. One is uh, uh, domestic heating as well as transportation as identified in the national uh, program for improving their quality with the kind support of our colleagues in the World Bank. And these projects uh, are, the, the, the beneficiaries of these projects are uh, those that are in the municipalities uh, that are affected by this national program, uh, quoted um, by the decision of the European Court. And uh, we, uh, they have, so in uh, about 800, uh, 800, uh, so going on to the next slide. So the key, the key procedure 
that affects uh, this is related to the uh, the change uh, the replacement the replacement of uh, certain devices for heating um, in houses and this is done by the municipalities this is uh, done uh, this is uh, done to uh, the idea is to recycle their old devices and the alternatives uh, so the, the idea is to replace the old heaters also uh, they can connect to some to the electrical system or to the gas uh, network so about 60 million uh, is provided uh, in a pilot program uh, eight eight um, municipalities are supported in bulgaria so we expect about 28,000 uh, 20, of, of residences to be uh, to benefit from this uh, measure and other uh, another uh, program that we work on uh, is is related to addressing uh, pollution from transportation. We have identified 10 municipalities for, uh, uh, and the support is mainly aimed at replacing some of the uh, high emission diesel uh, vehicles uh, in, domestic, uh, in, in, in public transportation with some low emission uh, cars, uh, trams and cars. So we also get uh, some uh, support for, uh, all this is aimed for, uh, for implementing these new vehicles. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trams and uh, buses are expected, uh, about uh, 60 trolley buses and 25 trams. And uh, this will also contribute uh, to the fact that uh, that uh, we we hopefully we will we will encourage citizens to give up their own personal transportation and to use public transportation and this is how we will be able to contribute to uh, meet the climate requirements and uh, finally i would like to thank you for your attention and i'm uh, available for questions Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Vitkova. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. I sure have one. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in uh, the uh, question related to uh, the behavior of citizens. So, we think that uh, uh, taking uh, into consideration the comfort, the, uh, the the modern lifestyle or something that is updated and more contemporary that will be uh, offered by the municipality, we hope that citizens will gladly participate and they will take the public transportation. We see some uh, such uh, motivation in some European projects, some other programs motivate by uh, the material, by the monetary benefit uh, of uh, taking public transportation. And so uh, we often talk about that this is, this, this needs, so all these, we think that maybe all these measures need to be uh, targeting and aimed at citizens. Is it possible or do we have to persuade them? Do we have to uh, conduct campaigns uh, to promote, to encourage them so that uh, the, the citizens are able to take these measures? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was waiting for the interpretation. Thank you. Yes, the work with the citizens is key. It is it is very important because in in practice, in real life, they are the direct beneficiaries of all uh, all all these measures, and this uh, comes through the municipalities. So in both the procedures, the informational campaigns, the one that is uh, replaced to, uh, uh, that, that is uh, re associated with the replacement of space heaters, this is done 
in um, uh, in in the various locations, uh, having a direct contact with the citizens is of key importance. This is taken into consideration by the municipalities, and efforts are being taken. And the administration, uh, the ministry, also takes this into consideration. We plan national measures. We uh, we uh, have the planned a national campaign that would cover the country at large so that we can reach as many consumers as possible. Thank you, Ms. Svetkova. Uh, so we mentioned uh, the name of uh, Ms. Kolova. Perhaps uh, uh, Ms. Kolova would like to uh, to to add to what Ms. Kolova was saying. We cannot hear the speaker. Can we hear each other now? Can we hear? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes. Now we can hear you. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for this invitation to take part in this webinar for air quality, which uh, has been most interesting for me. And I can say definitely that it is a great source of exchange of information, uh, exchange of methods, good practices. And I can hope that I can also be of some benefit and helpful to the participants with my presentation. My presentation is related to the national funds that uh, our country has uh, provided or envisions to provide in order to improve the air quality. Now, if I can please play my presentation and we will, uh, we can proceed to the first slide. The next slide, please. So the air pollution uh, in our country is significant. It is a challenging environmental problem, uh, which is related to physical, geographical, uh, social, economic, and anthropological factors. Uh, bringing the air quality in the country in compliance with the regulation and objectives in the European directives, although difficult, can be achieved. For the last 20 years, our country has made significant progress in terms of uh, controlled pollutants. So, as uh, our previous uh, speakers mentioned, unfortunately, Bulgaria was convicted of uh, not for non-compliance uh, with the regulations for fine dust particles on the territory of the country. To close the criminal procedures related to the case, we need to take um, uh, very uh, prompt emergency measures to become compliant with the regulations for fine particles. Now, next slide, please. Within the framework of the national commitments uh, in uh, compliance with the Clean Air Act, uh, we have developed two national programs, uh, the National Program for Improving Air Quality, uh, 2018 to uh, 2024, and the National Program for Air Pollution Control. So in accordance with the requirements of the law, the uh, municipalities uh, which have impaired ambient air quality have developed uh, programs with measures to achieve compliance with the regulations. And the fine funding is provided uh, by the municipal budget as well as European structural funds. Unfortunately, these funds are inadequate, they're not sufficient to achieve compliance with the regulations. So, and now if we can go to the next slide. Uh, in implementation of the adopted national development plan, we uh, uh, we expect uh, 
uh, the enterprise for management of environmental protection activities to finance measures to improve the ambient air. As the uh, as uh, Ms. and Mr. Sandov said, uh, the amount that we expect amounts uh, it, it will amount to uh, seventy to maybe uh, correction um, thirty to seventy million less. This was uh, developed by a mechanism to improve the air quality, and this will be implemented through the enterprise. The mechanism will address the country's main problem with ambient air quality at national level, given the continuing problems with excessive levels of particulate matter and will create a new approach of funding measures aimed at certain sectors which have been identified, including via um, uh, pollution. Uh, so this will be done, uh, which will cover the area of uh, he, uh, residential heating and transportation. So this mechanism intended to function in synergy with other national and municipal programs and offer certain flexibility in the types of measures and ways to implement them in order to provide additional opportunities in the application of policies. So this uh, this uh, we will we aim to uh, use certain measures, certain goals, and as there will be certain beneficiaries. The measures uh, implemented by this mechanism have a cumulative effect in terms of improving ambient air quality. This approach, through its developments and implementation, is a commitment of the country and an expression of its efforts to address the problem in the long run in a sustainable manner. Now going on to the next slide, the funding uh, will be give, uh, funding will be given to municipalities with impaired air quality, especially the municipalities that were listed in the ruling of the European uh, Court of Justice. As was mentioned by the other panelists, uh, Bulgaria in Bulgaria has 28 municipalities that have exceeded uh, their uh, limits uh, of uh, fine uh, of particulate matter. Uh, so we have 28 municipalities. Yes, that is that is a lot. But it also uh, we we work uh, we try to use different funding measures in the country. So measures and visits in the mechanism aim to provide funding for activities aimed at reducing the levels of particulate matter uh, by uh, constructing uh, local heating stations, replacing space heaters uh, on solid fuel with uh, fuel in municipal buildings and households. And the idea is to use other financial tools that are uh, or focused on primarily on residency residences. Uh, so uh, we will also uh, allow the municipalities to apply for residences as well. Uh, so these are different uh, heaters. Uh, uh, they can be that can use electricity or biomass or some other means so that can be uh, connected to the network or they can use different panels and uh, they can also use the solar panels or the introduction of heating systems using heat pumps and hydrogen installation. If we can proceed to the next slide, the measures aimed at reducing the levels of particulate matter generated by traffic and transport uh, by phasing out high emission personal diesel vehicles and encouraging the use of electrical cars, bearing in mind that the emissions from transportation are not the main of a source of emissions, uh, contributing to the registered excess of particulate matter. Uh, this affects the air quality in large urban areas, and this measure is expected to be applied in municipalities that have announced the introduction of low emission traffic zones. Uh, 
So there's also a plan to support the purchase of electrical vehicles by households and the central administration, the regional divisions and municipal administrations. The allocated funds will be in the amount of uh, uh, 12,000 Bulgarian levs, but no more than 30% of the value of the purchase vehicles. If we can now proceed to, uh, so we need to conclude uh, within a minute. Uh, from uh, so, yes, I'm towards the end of my uh, presentation. So, and the last measure is aimed at reducing the levels of particulate matter generated by resuspension by purchasing equipment for washing streets and pavements, funded primarily by, by municipalities, planting large scale green areas and forming green corridors, rings and belts in populated areas enabling improved ventilation and capturing absorption dust by transforming muddy and gray areas into green spots by planting grass, renovation of the terrain and landscaping. This is in general, uh, some of the measures that we hope to implement and we hope to launch in the very near future. The municipalities have expressed interest and we hope that we will be able to implement these measures so we can achieve the specific results. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I will be happy to respond. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Gullivan. Uh, one question. This is a question related. Uh, so this is related to the owners of old diesel vehicles. So uh, you mentioned that they will be offered the opportunity to buy electric uh, vehicles. I understand that there is a big market in Bulgaria is it uh, uh, is there any funding or financial assistance provided to citizens uh, is there any uh, uh, so, is, is there any funding for citizens to buy uh, to buy uh, newer cars? Are there any such measures? Thank you very much for this question. Unfortunately, at this time, uh, there are no such measures, and uh, this is done. Uh, there are some measures developed by the ministry. Uh, issues have been identified. Uh, of course, some uh, financial discounts for the users. But so this will be a pilot project that will be mainly aimed at uh, the citizens in those municipalities. Uh, this is, uh, as it was mentioned before, the flea, the the car fleet is very old and we will be able to provide some bonuses and we are hoping to help uh, uh, people realize there will be informational uh, campaigns that uh, they and hopefully they will be able to uh, realize that this will improve their uh, quality of life, uh, their health, and this will also create low emission zones. This is a way for us to achieve this result and hopefully citizens will be able to resort and buy electrical vehicles rather than old diesel ones. Thank you. Oui, je, je vous remercie. Je peux vous donner l'exemple de la France euh, qui a essayé aussi d'accélérer la so I can give you, I can share France's experience. We tried to accelerate. We tried to take certain measures, specifically, uh, we would give them a bonus uh, or some financial assistance to people who are ready to throw away their old vehicle and they would get some bonus for it and this way of this was very successful but despite everything uh, this replacement of old vehicles is a very slow process 
Now, I would like to say thank you for your participation and your intervention. And now I would like to turn to Ms. Eva Petkova and she will talk to us about the flag program. Hello, hello. <laughs> we are a little bit uh, ahead of time, but uh, I'll try to stick uh, with the most important things about uh, Fun Flag. First of all, I would like to thank the French Embassy for the invitation of uh, Fun Flag and uh, yeah, you may see on the screen the presentation. Please, next slide. Uh, about FUNFLEC, FUNFLEC uh, is the fund for local authorities and governments in Bulgaria. It has been created 15 years ago uh, as a 100% state-owned instrument for uh, regional policy development. The fund is targeted at financing Bulgarian municipalities. And um, up to now, you may see the results speak for themselves. Uh, more than 1,300 loans for around uh, 1 billion euro for the implementation of infrastructure rural projects amounting uh, more than uh, 3.6 billion euro. So uh, FLAC really has proved to be a very trusted and respected partner of Bulgarian municipalities uh, in the last years, uh, we have uh, supported uh, most of the projects that are implemented with grants as uh, FLAG's main role is either to provide bridge financing or a financing of own contribution of municipalities. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, the main drivers of FLAG's uh, success uh, has been uh, several, but at least three. First of all, um, the fund has uh, quite an even approach to all Bulgarian municipalities, uh, regardless of uh, their size. So FLAG uh, supported uh, small, medium or uh, larger municipalities. Moreover, Fund FLAG has uh, quite good relationships with uh, IFIs and uh, Bulgarian trade banks. And uh, together with uh, the EAB, as Mr. Radonov said in 2020, uh, Fund FLAG has established the Bulgarian Investment and Advisory Platform. But uh, Fund FLAG also has quite a substantial uh, experience in financial instruments for urban development. In uh, 2012, uh, the Fund for Sustainable Urban Development, a FLAC uh, subsidiary has been created to play the role of an urban development fund uh, in uh, Sofia. 50% of the funds were provided by the OP uh, Regional Development. Later on in uh, 2018, uh, Fund FLAC, uh, together with the United Bulgarian Bank, uh, has um, has taken part in the procurement procedure for selection of the new urban development funds. And uh, thus was created the Sustainable Cities Fund, uh, which is the urban development fund for Sofia and Southern Bulgaria for, uh, for the former uh, programming period 2014-2020. Uh, we are still in a process of active investment of uh, these resources into viable uh, urban development projects. Next slide, please. Here I have shown uh, several examples from our uh, practice. Uh, some of them are financed by FLEX, some of them are financed by the investment platform set with the AB, and some of them are financed by the urban development funds. Here on the first slide, you may see the projects uh, financed with grants either by the OP environment or by OP regions in growth, uh, both operational programs provided resources for uh, introduction of more eco-friendly transport as uh, those two projects of Burgas and Pleven were targeted at uh, improvement of air quality in uh, both cities. You may see here uh, FLAC has supported with uh, substantial bridge loans, uh, but uh, there is also a co-financing part from the investment platform in regard of the uh, Burgas uh, project. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Here you may see a very interesting set of projects that were financed uh, by the Urban Development Funds, and uh, we are quite proud uh, with them, as uh, they were the front runners of the uh, electro vehicle uh, friends uh, that uh, we see uh, now. Uh, the first project about urban electromobility was approved in 2018 and uh, 67 um, private charging station were, uh, were installed. All these projects are uh, a great example for a bottom-up approach because uh, these are not municipal projects. These are uh, projects of private investor, first of M-Mobility International, uh, then a fail drive charging. And uh, thus we have uh, financed uh, the first EV charging network in Sofia, first with 67 um, stations. Now um, we are in a process of um, implementation of a second project that builds on the results of the first one. More than 19 um, charging stations are installed by now and uh, we are uh, heading to uh, probably uh, at least other 80. And uh, in the southern Bulgaria, the same, the same private company is experiencing quite an upheaval. They're quite interested in um, enlarging the, the available EV charging infrastructure. So uh, they are heading to, uh, to smaller uh, cities. And uh, you may see the number of charging stations is around uh, 30 charging station installed by now. Next slide, please. Here are some examples also for project financed uh, by the Urban Development Funds, but uh, these uh, with a more clear focus, focus on urban street infrastructure and on uh, improvement of uh, urban areas. Next slide, please. Uh, the main lessons and takeaways, um, we may say that uh, the fund flag uh, seeks to be effectively involved in the regional recovery uh, process, but uh, the, the main uh, lessons are for the next programming period that um, it's very important the combination of finance and combination of different kinds of sport. Uh, it's very important uh, to uh, establish a clear pathway of uh, providing technical um, expertise and technical assistance, especially to municipalities, but also uh, for more ambitious uh, green projects that uh, there is no sufficient expertise neither in uh, in the municipalities nor in the banking sector. Uh, and third, uh, of course, uh, we shall continue with lowering the investment barriers to, to finance uh, such projects. Um, we saw the last year, 2021, a uh, very huge interest from uh, Bulgarian municipalities uh, in the Urban Development Fund for Southern Bulgaria, but also in the framework of the investment platform set with the AIB uh, for financing of infrastructural projects, for financing of projects uh, for energy efficiency, uh, for renewables. And uh, FundFlag uh, will continue its work to, to provide uh, more uh, different products that are suitable for municipalities and that are fitted to the uh, Green Deal um, main aims. Uh, we hope that uh, this platform with the investment, uh, with the European Investment Bank uh, will be continued uh, as uh, these 100 million uh, level uh, are already contracted, fully contracted. And uh, there is still uh, interest from municipalities for uh, more financing for targeted projects. Uh, that's for, from on my side. Uh, if you have any questions, I am available.
Alors, je vous remercie, euh, donc, euh, Madame Petkova. Je n'ai pas bien saisi qui est Thank derrière. Thank you, Miss Petkova. Est-ce que c'est l'Union européenne Est-ce que c'est une banque Est-ce que c'est associé avec d'autres financeurs En fait, quelle est la structure juridique d'offre Which institution Is it a bank or the a European uh, is union institutions or something else? What is the institution that you turn to with a request? So uh, legally speaking, uh, is Flag a company? It Does it have a location? Does it have an office? Does it have headquarters? Or is it uh, scattered around uh, and it is split in uh, various um, locations? No. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Funflag, uh, yes, uh, it has an office, but uh, it's centralized, it's in Sofia. We are a very small uh, team of experts. Uh, All of us almost started uh, at least 10 years ago, including me. Uh, so yes, we are working from here uh, to the whole Bulgaria, and it proved quite a good, uh, quite a good model. Uh, so we are a very small team, but we have uh, great uh, we have great results by now, and uh, we are continuing to. Um, to explore more and more possibilities for providing uh, municipal uh, products, financing products. Uh, the fund is a legal structure, a non-financing uh, institution, uh, non-banking financial institution, um, Half of the equity uh, is from the Bulgarian state, uh, and also the fund works with uh, IFIs, uh, uh, first with EBRD, afterwards uh, with uh, the Bulgarian, uh, the biggest uh, banks that are uh, here in Bulgaria, with Unicredit Bull Bank, with uh, United Bulgarian Bank in the framework of the Urban Development Funds, So uh, it uh, has proved to be a, quite a good aggregator, especially for IFIs to, um, to grant um, loans to smaller municipalities, uh, which are not eligible for funding either by EBRD or EIB. Thank you greatly. And one final question. Um, actually, maybe it's not a question. <coughs> are the, so are these programs related to medium size? <coughs> or let's say lower taxed uh, uh, layers of society of population or are they are they not uh, aimed to administrations are they related to the mode of transportation and the necessity that uh, low-income people or, uh, yes, low-income people are facing. As Fund Flag is a regional development fund, its main target is municipalities and municipal companies. As far as urban development funds uh, are concerned, Um, there, the possible uh, eligible final recipients are either municipalities or private companies. So uh, they provide uh, more, more possibilities for different stakeholders. 
As far as uh, the urban transport is, is concerned, yes, the urban development funds can finance uh, ecological urban transport. So that's why you may see these examples with the EV charging infrastructure. In fact, um, the fund under Jessica Initiative, afterwards, uh, the Sustainable Cities Funds are uh, the first institution that have uh, financed uh, with loans uh, the creation of EV charging infrastructure in Bulgaria. Um, as far as uh, you, you've concerned, uh, if uh, we are targeted to poorer municipalities or uh, uh, beneficiaries, um, no, all, uh, as I've said in the beginning, all municipalities are eligible for, for financing, but um, of course, those who are less, de less developed uh, need more financing, so uh, FLAG targets them uh, mostly. Merci beaucoup, Madame Petkova. Donc, je vous propose d'arrêter là. Thank you very much, Ms. Petkova. Thank you. With this, we will conclude the presentations because we're running out of time. And we're towards the end of this webinar. We will now hear to two final presentations. One is by Five Pillard. I will now give the floor to Mr. Saïd, Mr. Saïd, prior to that, Excellent. Actually, before that, we will uh, give the floor to Mr. François de Berg. Thank uh, the French Embassy for the opportunity given to, uh, to present uh, this topic and being uh, the sponsor of that event. We have discussed today mostly of, uh, let's say, outdoor air quality. Huh? Uh, but I wanted to, uh, to hint at uh, another problem with air, which is the indoor air quality. And to introduce the topic, I will make it short because there is just a short movie after. Three figures. First of all, 80%. It's the time that we spend indoor. Home, school, shopping mall, whatever. 3.8 million. It's the number of people that die prematurely of illness due to a bad uh, indoor air quality. And last but not the least, 15% is the result of a study made with uh, young pupils in mathematic grades, and it was the improvements on their results with an optimized ventilation. So this means that air quality indoor is as equally important as the outdoor air quality, which is obviously quite necessary for the ecological transformation. So why Veolia is also equally interested in that indoor is that because first of all, the air, as I just mentioned, has a big impact on our health. Then we have seen that also in all your presentation this afternoon. Uh, there is a huge demand from society to get better environments. So indoor is part of it, right? Another topic which is quite interesting is that usually managing the air quality with the energy efficiency, both of them, there are resources at the end of the day and managing them together can bring a good lot of synergies. So just to finish on that introduction and I will let the movie on, uh, indoor air quality should not be let aside. It's part of the, I would say, of this big approach uh, to, uh, to improve our environment with two very important, I guess, uh, takeaways. Obviously the, the health, of our colleagues, of our families, uh, because with good air quality, you can better manage, the, for example, the virus, the airborne virus, but also to increase the productivity and to increase also the, the cognitive performance. So I will not speak anymore. It was a short introduction and I uh, will leave uh, uh, the movie go on. And if you have any question, feel free to send it on the chat. I will be happy to answer. Thanks a lot. Improving access to resources while preserving and replenishing those resources is what we do at Veolia. 
Air pollution has a huge impact on public health and quality of life, particularly inside buildings, where it is a major risk factor to our health. We must reduce long-term exposure to pollutants in order to limit respiratory diseases, asthma, and cardiovascular problems. We put solutions in place every day to guarantee excellent indoor air quality. We measure different pollutants in real time, optimize treatment systems, and involve occupants in improving indoor air quality. How and why at it lasts. We spend more than 80% of our time indoors, in shopping malls, offices, schools, healthcare institutions, hotels, etc. Indoors, we are exposed to a significant amount of air pollution. We test ventilation and air treatment equipment to make sure that it works correctly and look for potential sources of pollution. Smart sensors are rolled out in living spaces on a wide scale. They continuously measure air quality, including its temperature, humidity, and amount of carbon dioxide, both in particulate matter and volatile organic compounds. This data is transferred in real time to a monitoring center where it is analyzed. Our experts use state-of-the-art algorithms to anticipate and understand the results. The assessment may be a short-term one or part of a more in-depth study. The most suitable solutions for improvement are then put in place, such as filtration, ventilation, remediation, and predictive maintenance. They guarantee indoor air quality and allow buildings to meet their energy efficiency targets. Everyone can access information about indoor and outdoor air quality. Customers can track changes to their parameters of air quality on an online dashboard and make sure that they are consistent with the expected performance. Occupants can use educational applications to learn about the air they breathe and find out how to adapt their behavior to protect their health and keep air clean. When people are more aware of what is at stake, they begin to take ownership of air quality inside buildings. By controlling the environmental maintenance of buildings, we guarantee excellent indoor air quality to all occupants and ensure the economic and energy performance of the facilities for our clients. Merci donc à Monsieur de Berg et à cette. À cette Thank vidéo. you very much, Mr. de Berg. And thank you very much for the interpreter who was supposed to very quickly uh, produce the interpretation. Thank you very much to to uh, to you. It is true that we do not often speak about the quality of air in indoor in indoor uh, indoor uh, facilities but this is a very important issue there are two uh, two uh, so uh, so there are two groups that deal with open air and indoor air and Five Pillar aims to combine the efforts of both. Thank you very much. We will now listen to Mr. Uh, uh, Fouad Said. We do not have audio, unfortunately. We do not have audio. Uh, can you hear me now? We prepared a short video which explains our strategy for cleaning 
And also, what are the technologies that uh, that we envision? And uh, I kindly ask you to uh, for us to see the video. Merci pour, pour la vidéo. Merci Thank you. Thank you for the video. Il y a effectivement beaucoup d'informations dans la vidéo. Je suis à votre disposition pour répondre à vos éventuelles questions. If you have any questions, I'm at your disposal. Thank you, Mr. Saïd. We realize that the industry has funds and the means to bring about considerably lower emission levels. And uh, they can reduce their emissions. So speaking of industry in your company, I think that we should also look for other solutions. We should look for solutions elsewhere. Uh, 
vos équipements peuvent-ils intervenir Parce que j'ai l'impression que nous, on, on a de moyens finalement d'agir. Est-ce que votre équipement peut être appliqué à des plus petites unités de plus petits utilisateurs Qu'est-ce que vous pensez Merci, Jérôme, pour cette question très pertinente. Il y a effectivement les large combustion plants, comme vous l'avez cité, où on atteint des, des puissances qui peuvent aller jusqu'à 200 mégawatts thermiques. Donc, ça représente. Oui, yes, indeed. We have large capacities as in 200 megawatts. We also provide solutions. For instance, um, some city or municipal installations with smaller capacity. And we can provide some numbers, as in one megawatt, for instance. One megawatt, thermal megawatt. This is a small uh, city heating unit for a unit, for a building, for instance. It is true that some of your products can be of interest to Bulgaria. Uh, but we also uh, should consider heating. Which allows uh, and uh, is looking for different alternatives for these solutions. Est-ce que c'est encore euh, est-ce qu'il y a des possibilités de passer à des So should we should we focus on the burners uh, the boilers Or should we look for maybe an alternative fuel as a biomass or something else So, do, are we talking about these hypotheses for heating, of talking about uh, individual heating? Yes, indeed. By all means, we need to conduct an expert assessment and evaluation so that we know what the characteristics of the project are when we talk about uh, of a new installation, if we talk about whether we talk about replacement of a burner, these are different things. So all of these objectives, considering the criteria, it depends on what we, what we are aiming in order to bring down the rates, bring down the limits, we need to make an evaluation of the current situation and also prepare a project, maybe for a brand new installation, and also uh, not only uh, fuels, but also ventilation and the dispersion of the heat in the entire building or installation. So the most uh, sensitive thing is sizing, determining the size. For that reason, we need to reach out to local uh, actors and they need to tell us what exactly they want to achieve. So that we, so that our project can meet their demands. What would you advise? We do not have um, in trans interpretation into Bulgarian. Apologies. So, continuing, I suppose that uh, these regulations will be even stricter. And what advice would you give? Mais est-ce qu'elle doit anticiper et mettre en œuvre des choses encore beaucoup plus performantes 
to a manufacturer who currently relies on the existing limits or regulations and seeing the uh, possibility for new norms, what, uh, what uh, solutions would you offer? Yes, of course. Everybody needs to, to envision what might happen. From the European rates point of view, the manufacturers need to apply the best possible uh, equipment. They need to utilize the best possible solutions. We're not only talking about uh, meeting and um, keeping to the European regulations, but also they need to envision uh, the possibility of its evolution. And then we need to ask the question about the investment that that uh, that uh, that uh, that. Uh, that that requires meeting these uh, limits and re regulations. So should we increase the limits or should we uh, decrease the limits? How do we meet these requirements? The investments at the end of the day, given the limitations related to environment, the, uh, they do allow uh, using a burner to, to reduce to a minimum the adverse consequences without uh, complete overhaul of the system. The, the question is, how much does a burner cost? For instance, a, a, a burner for a boiler in a shared building, uh, 100 to 200,000 euros. This is a reasonable price if we're talking about a residential building. If we want to clear some of the older systems, if we want to do away with them, uh, to, to get rid of some old pollutants, then the investment would require millions of euros. Thank you very much. Uh, you have provided uh, your contact information. It is rather late. We ran over time. And I uh, propose that we conclude uh, with the webinar, with this presentation. I would like to thank all the participants, as well as the uh, World Congress event, uh, the company that organized this uh, this uh, this event, as well as uh, the French Embassy in Sofia. We thank them for uh, the uh, the organization of this event. Uh, special thanks to Madam Ambassador, as well as to her team, to all the participants and the interpreters who did a great job. Thank you to everybody for your patience that you stayed behind uh, to the end of this webinar. And I'm sure that we will provide all the presentations uh, that were presented. So you will uh, receive the presentations in the very near future. I will now uh, conclude uh, this webinar and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you.